Hello there. Good morning to you. Six o'clock, Wednesday, the 10th of April. Uh, this is Breakfast. You're tuned in to with Eamon Holmes and Isabel Webster, and you're very welcome. And leading the news this morning, a landmark review into gender care has revealed thousands of children let down by the NHS through a shocking lack of research on treatments given to those questioning their gender. Tory backlash against the latest ECHR ruling, which means individuals can sue for a breach of human rights if Britain fails to meet net zero targets. Yes, among Conservative MPs, momentum is certainly building to leave the ECHR. But what's the Prime Minister planning to do about it? Find out more with me very soon. Heightened security at sports matches in England, Spain and France despite terror threats from Islamic State. And the campaigner and former postmaster Alan Bates has hit out at his former bosses as thugs in suits as the post office inquiry reveals the full extent of the IT scandal. It might be a bright start out there for some of us, but more rain is on the way. However, it will also turn a bit warmer over the next couple of days. Full details with me in the forecast coming up. Uh, so much to get through this morning. Uh, we will want your views on that, so do get in touch with us. Isabel will tell you how, because I don't know. <laughs> it's gbnews.com forward slash your say. Of the news it portal is. on our website. We're all becoming familiar with it. Yeah, so uh, lots of controversial subjects. We begin mm. with the Energy Secretary, Claire Cantino, who has led a Conservative backlash against the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, after they said, uh, or they ruled against a landmark Swiss ruling. The EHR, based in Strasbourg, has ruled that Switzerland is violating human rights over their lack of an action on climate change. Well, the row comes after a poll in the Telegraph newspaper revealed that nearly 50% of Conservative voters approve of leaving the ECHR. Well, let's get the views this morning uh, in all of this of our political correspondent, Olivia Artley. Good morning to you, Luke, to you, Olivia. Funnily enough, this could play very well for Rishi Sunak, couldn't it? Because the ECHR is, is deeply unpopular. It gives him an excuse to leave something which is potentially blocking his landmark Rwanda flights. Well, absolutely. The ECHR is becoming more and more unpopular, both in the wider public, where about half of Conservative voters at the 2019 election would now like to leave, and within the Conservative Party itself. Claire Cortino, the Energy Secretary, who said that she was concerned about this ruling, is a very close ally of Rishi Sunak's, indeed, probably his closest friend in the Cabinet. So the fact that she is leading this revolt, as The Telegraph put it, can be seen, really, as evidence that this is now probably personally what Rishi Sunak would like to do as well. Now, this ruling will have an effect on Britain. Essentially, what's happened is eight Swiss women uh, went to the ECHR and said that their right to a private life has been uh, disrupted by climate change. They say that their particular demographic is particularly affected. One woman said that she couldn't leave her house for three weeks because of a heat wave. Now, that legislation is legally binding, that ECHR legislation, and will trickle down into UK law. So we could indeed end up in a situation where people could sue the government if the government fails to meet its net zero commitments. Now, that is a situation which the government absolutely does not want. And as you say, Isabel, that's not the only problem uh, as far as the ECHR is concerned. Rishi Sunak thinks that the ECHR is stopping him get his Rwanda legislation through. So could this be the excuse that the Prime Minister needs to put leaving the ECHR on the Conservative manifesto? There are lots of MPs who think that it makes sense as a final roll of the dice. So he would put it on the agenda and he would say, if you re-elect us, we will get out of the ECHR, and that may prove to be popular. If we don't re-elect them, there's no chance of us leaving the ECHR. There's probably no chance of us leaving the ECHR if we do re-elect them as well. Um, Labour will not leave the ECHR. 
Well, absolutely. And obviously, Labour is a very far ahead in the polls at the moment. Keir Starmer has no interest whatsoever in leading the ECHR. That said, I mean, it will probably be cold comfort to the Conservatives. But over the last week or two, the Labour's poll lead is actually lessening slightly. Uh, Labour has gone down three points in the polls. We don't really yet know why that is, but it is a statistically significant change. Rishi Sunak might, might now be thinking, right, what can we do to get some more clear blue water between ourselves and Labour? And leaving the ECHR is definitely one option. Rishi Sunak said that he wanted to get those flights off the ground to Rwanda by the spring. Well, we're now pushing for mid-April and obviously there is no sign yet that any flights are leaving soon. If he gets hamstrung again by the House of Lords or more likely the courts, then he could just think, well, hang on a minute, what's holding us back here? If it's leaving the ECHR, then now's the time to put it on our manifesto. Um, I think it was Greta Thunberg yesterday saying that human rights shouldn't be in the hands of politicians. Claire Coutinho, as you say there, Olivia, saying this was a profoundly undemocratic decision that was made yesterday. We'd love people at home to let us know what they think in all of this. Um, just whilst we've got you, I want to talk about Lord Cameron. He's been out and about in the States, obviously starting in Mar-a-Lago in Florida, jetting up to Washington, holding that joint press conference yesterday. But it seems he's been snubbed by the Speaker of the House. What's gone on there? Well, David Cameron is essentially telling the Republican Party that they need to be uh, investing more money in Ukraine. That doesn't seem to be going down too well in America, which is a little bit of a problem for David Cameron. He did that slick little video last week telling British voters exactly what he's doing uh, for the world on, on the world stage as the Foreign Secretary. But the fact that he isn't going down too well in the US, he was supposed to be that Foreign Secretary who was capable of representing Britain's interests because of his background, because he was Prime Minister, because he was supposed to have gravitas. But does he really? Okay. Uh, okay, thanks. We've got to leave it there, Olivia. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, big story you're going to hear a lot of throughout the day. Um, the National Health Service um, has been ordered to review gender care for children. This is follows a damning report. It was the CAS review, and it found no evidence that the use of blockers which delay puberty led to better mental health outcomes. Yes, the author of the report, Dr Hilary Cass, had this to say. These are all unregulated drugs. You know, they're all unlicensed, whether it's puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones. They're unlicensed drugs used experimentally for children and adolescents with gender dysphoria or gender distress. And so if you're offering these drugs with no diagnosis, no assessment even, um, and no follow-up, no monitoring, no blood tests, then you're, you know, the risk of, you know, patient safety is huge. Well, uh, let's speak to diversity and inclusion facilitator with her views on all this. That is Katie John Went. And Katie, you have been through this whole process um, yourself. What are you making of this landmark report, which, um, which seems quite damning of the existing policy? Well, as you say, I've been through the whole process, but quite some time ago. Um, and I think the report may, is mainly concerned about teenagers. It's not concerned about adults like me who did it in later years and took a long, long time making up their mind about it. And definitely for someone like me who felt it from a very, very young age. Indeed, Hilary Cass actually does say there is still evidence that it is, can be the right thing for some people who have persistently felt it from a young age. And some of the evidence on um, cross-sex hormones shows that it does lead to somebody having a better life and someone having reduced uh, distress, etc. She doesn't turn around and 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 kind of say that transgender doesn't exist. She doesn't turn around and say that gender identity, gender dysphoria, gender incongruence, whatever you want to call it, and the name changes kind of every edition of the DSM or the ICD, the classifications of diseases. Um, she doesn't say that it doesn't exist. She does say that we need to be cautious, extremely cautious now. Perhaps that's the difference between now and the, and the earlier version and other people's looks at this. We need to be extremely cautious when dealing with kids. Obviously, 
there's no actual kind of intervention with kids. What we're talking about is teenagers going through puberty and putting puberty on pause. I think the language that puberty goes on pause with puberty blockers is kind of pretty much gone for good around this. Everyone probably acknowledges that if you put a kid, if you put a teenager on a puberty right, blocker, she's not saying it doesn't exist, but she's not saying exactly it does exist to the extent that it has been listened to yes. and treated so far. No, exactly. And, and, and she rightly says that, that we need to look at all of the other causes and, and that it is, a, it is a mental distress. And where there are other causes, we need to be really cautious that we're not treating some, some other cause with the, the transgender solution. And, and I 100% agree with that. We know that up to three quarters of people who are, are kind of are going through gender distress aren't actually what we would have called transgender in, in the old school kind of diagnosis. The fact that we're diagnosing it younger, but then giving an adult treatment to it is, is where the kind of the issue is. And and she's talking about the fact that there's a, a very kind of constructive. I think it's, it's constructive. Many trans people won't, and I only speak for myself. I don't represent a trans community. She sees a, a, a very constructive approach, suggesting that this should shift to a cross disciplinary kind of uh, pediatric basis for this. That there should be long term, very slow support. She uses the word unhurried, which I think is in, 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 actually very sensible. It's, which we what we used to talk about ten years plus back ago was the watch and wait aspect and, and it needs to be moving back to that and there's a sort of identity um issue or, or she's certainly identified in this report an issue around what she calls exceptional toxicity that this stormy discourse that no one can talk about it without such strong opinions has actually let down these children so much and particularly the role of activist charities in heaping pressure not only on the nhs but also on parents who've been led to believe if they don't deal with this imminently before their child hits puberty they might kill themselves or they might self-harm which is has led to these decisions, rushed decisions, and huge pressure. Do you agree with that? Actually, that's the biggest thing I do agree with. The whole polarisation, and you know, and I think she used the word stifling of debate. I'm, the, the biggest thing I'm known for is I believe in dialogue and debate, and it was one of the aspects um, when this kind of all began to be questioned and queried. Everything that you look at, particularly if you're looking at evidence-based medicine, you, you need to examine it, you need to test it, you need to explore it. The fact that people had PhDs blocked when they were looking to do a PhD on, on transition or on detransition, and, and the fact that six out of seven of the adult gender clinics were kind of disinclined to be part of the follow-up studies of the cohort of 9,000 teenagers who kind of came through um, the Tavistock, went on to adult clinics, and then the adult clinics said, look, we don't want to do the studies that you want to do to see where these people are going. And the fact that there's a resistance there means we're not following up on the evidence. So even medicine is kind of scared of this polarisation. Yes. And we need to be able to have these dialogues and have these debates um, without getting offended by it, but also without deliberately kind of causing offence by it yeah. um, and actually try and do it in such a way as to maintain the humanity of the individuals involved. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, why, that's why it's, it's great talking to you because you're doing mm -hmm. all of those things. Katie, could I ask you, how old are you? <laughs> I could make a joke. You should never ask a woman that question. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's, I'm flexible on kind of identity terminology. You can ask a person that question. I'm 57. Yeah. Did you say 57? Yeah, I know. Hormones are good for you. Look. Oh, well, I'll tell you right, what. Yeah. Good. Absolutely. Well done there. That that's amazing. Now, that's absolutely perfect because that puts you in the same sort of generational loop as me. And here's what I wanted to ask you. When I, I mean, when I was young at school and, and growing up as a teenager and whatever, Katie, I was not aware of this at all. People didn't come and say, you know, I'm a boy and I want to be a girl, or I'm a girl and I want to be a boy. You just didn't hear about it. Now we hear about it everywhere. So here's my question to you. Did it exist back in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, or is this just something that has come about in the last five, six, seven years? Well, when I went to school, I didn't know anyone, but then there was no way to kind of go through a process as a teenager then. So I didn't hear about hear about it, as it were, till I was an adult. When I went to university, there was no internet still. So that, so you, you couldn't, there was no kind of social pressure. There was no kind of so-called ideological pressure. There was no TikTok pressure. None of those things existed. Yeah. Yet I still felt the things that I felt, felt the distress that I felt 
from an early age, from around the age of five. But if you go back through the record, you can find the people like April Ashley. You will find trans people have always existed and people were transitioning in the 1960s and heading off to French surgeons in Morocco. You can go back to 1904 and Magnus Hirschfeld's book, The Third Sex, where he documents yes. people like this. So yes. people have always existed. Well, but like yeah, Bruce the Jenner. escalation. But they were yeah. very rare. They were very rare, Katie. That, that, that's the thing. And I'm, I'm just trying to work out, is this yeah. something that um, we have made in vogue or trendy. Um, you, you're mentioning, you know, people going to Tunisia and whatever, but mm. that would have been very rare, very, very rare. Um, 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 does that mean there were there were just hundreds or hundreds of thousands of people who were trapped in the in the wrong bodies? Mm. Why didn't we hear about it? Why didn't people discuss it with each other? Well, the, the NHS data from 20 odd years ago talked about one in 100,000 or one in, and I remember when they were talking about one in 100,000 uh, people in the trans communities there, early trans activists before the current kind of range, we're talking about the fact it's not one in 100,000, it's more like uh, one in 1,000. Yeah. Now they're saying it's not one in 1,000, it's more like one in 50. So there's been two kind of big kind uh -huh. of generational... Well, why, two why, big generational why, why am I... I'm, I'm trying to work out why, because the thing is, that if we get resistance and whatever from people, they'll say, oh, it wasn't like that in my day. And then you get people saying, kids saying, I want to be a cat, I want to be a pussy cat. I want somebody to tickle my belly and whatever, and schools are taking this, this seriously and I want a litter tray beside my desk and all this sort of thing. Um, well, where's, all this, where's all this come from? I, I think... Whether it's social contagion or whether it's social media contagion, and whether it's, in other words, whether it's just a social cohort, whether it's a, a group going through a class, going through a school, um, I've certain I've worked with trans youth or people or youth who have gender kind of questioning. That's the other way some people prefer to put it because, you know, you, you can't actually transition per se, so you can't actually really have transgender youth per se. But the, the numbers doing it, yes, has escalated. But the, what there is a difference. What I'm seeing is there's a huge crossover um, with kind of the, the, the neurodiversity cohort, a huge crossover with everything from eating disorders to bullying to yeah. body dysmorphia to the very pressure that you get from Instagram and TikTok. Yeah on how you look and if you don't look a certain way hey trans is the solution yeah. or maybe you are trans and put it was never put forward as maybe you are this but it was instead 20 years ago people who were under incredible distress trying yeah. everything else and then going to a psychiatrist as a last resort yeah. instead of going to a therapist um, or a school kind of representative as a first resort. And I yeah. and I think it's that jump from last it's resort to first resort. I'm sorry to rush you, but I just want yeah. to squeeze in this final point that, that Hilary Cass identifies in the report, which is the use of pronouns. Now, a minute ago, you said you're quite fluid on what you use, and she said that actually people have been too quick to allow their children to change their pronouns, to change their dress, uh, to make everybody at the school address them with a different name, and that actually this all needs to be slowed down. And I wonder if that feeds into what Eamon was saying about this huge rise because anyone who seemed to be questioning is suddenly being legitimised by adults when actually they're children and they're not really sure what they think yet. And we should be protecting them, surely, until they're much older. Well, as, as was said only this week, you know, social transition isn't a neutral act, but it isn't an entirely negative act either. Um, Recognising that for some people, um, if, if allowing them a degree of social transition, but saying this doesn't mean we're actually saying you are trans and you are this other person and the social transition doesn't merit you sudden access to the opposite sex spaces within a school environment. But if someone who comes to school and they're called Samantha and says from now on, I want to be called Sam and it's not even about gender, it's just say this is my preferred name. You, you call them by their preferred name if it helps you get on with better classroom behaviour and helps you get on with their education. But I don't think, yeah, lock, stock and barrel, full investment in our, you came to school on Monday morning and you say the, you are this and we now believe you are this. But courtesy and kind of navigating the spaces around people like that, addressing someone by name and avoiding pronouns is another way, simply doing it. Um, but yeah, I think there has to be kind of... Um, Someone ha if putting pe when people are in the system and then they're getting a letter from their doctor and say this person is going through the clinics, this person prefers to be known as, and this will actually benefit their mental health to be addressed in that way. When professionals are involved rather than someone just saying, I want to be this, there is a difference between gender dysphoria being classed as a, a pathology within mental health. And I know there's a shift away from the mental health pathology to it being kind of recognized as yeah. something else.
But for now, if you're talking about the well-being and the mental health of kids, then look at the well-being and the mental health of the kid. What is going to help and what is going to help classroom dynamics? Um, so, yeah, and not lock, stock and barrel, case by case decision. OK. Katie, John, you're fascinating to talk to and I would like to talk to you again in more depth on, the, on this programme. Indeed, what I'd like to do this morning is get views and comments from our listeners and, and viewers and put them to you if you're available live again later on uh, this morning because you, you talk with great reason there and, and I think people will understand you, your journey, what you've been through. Your age absolutely um, astounds me because you look 20 years younger. That, that is absolutely incredible. Um, and and it's, a, it's an amazing story to tell and your opinions on this cast report. So thank you for your time and your explanations um, this morning. Uh, we'll say goodbye to you for the moment. We'll see if we can get you up again uh, later today. Somebody will speak to you about that. Katie John Went, thank you very much indeed. Um, and, and I wonder, if, folks... can I just ask if that is his real name? Did he go Katie John Went? You know, because now he's a woman. Katie John Went. Or do you think it was he was already called John Went? I'd love to know. Maybe we'll find that out next hour. Well, is he still <laughs> That's a there? Fabulous name. You, are you still there, Katie? No. He's coming. Katie, Katie, you. I think Isabel has a question. Did he hear my question there? I, I heard the question absolutely, and I'm I'm, I'm fine with the humour of it. Um, John was John Jonathan was my birth name, um, but so was Catherine. I at, for, for the first couple of hours of my birth, they weren't sure what sex I was, and I was called Catherine. And then an hour or so later, the doctors came back and said, and "Actually, no, it's a boy." I did actually have. You might say I had natural puberty blockers. I didn't get a male puberty till I was eighteen. Oh. Um, so, but Went you know, is your surname and has always been your surname. Went is my surname. There you go. I just find I that fascinating. John, and I shifted John to my middle name to be 100% transparent. There we go. Yeah. And that's what you've been. Thank you very much indeed. Really appreciate talking to you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, right, so here's what we want from you. you you've heard Katie John talk there. Um, you, you've heard what the cast report contains um, today. Um, uh, evidence severely lacking in a lot of these uh, cases as to whether um, sex change is necessary or not. Let us know your views. Well, GBnews.com forward slash your say. say. So get in touch and we will deal with them. OK, we'll do those later on, shall we? We'll come back to those. We'll um, do them now. We want to do them now. David Webb, NHS should be for basic medical care, all in block caps. Anything else should be done privately. Uh, gender services should not be part of NHS. What a waste of money. Um, and lots of you getting in touch as well. We'll reflect on those a little bit later on with Katie. OK, uh, we will see if we get Katie John back later in the programme to answer uh, questions like that, which mm. I think will be very good. Uh, some other stories uh, you're waking up to on this Wednesday morning, MP William Reich has resigned from the Conservative Party after admitting he did give his colleagues phone numbers to a suspected scammer. He'll now sit as an independent MP in the Commons. Reich has claimed he was manipulated into sharing other politicians' personal numbers as part of a sexting scam. The former sub-postmaster, Alan Bates, has told the Horizon IT inquiry the post office spent 23 years attempting to discredit and silence him. The inquiry has been looking into what led to the wrong, wrongful prosecution of more than 900 sub-postmasters, all caused by errors in the Horizon IT software. Mr Bates has been giving his version of events ahead of appearances today by senior executives. Britain has taken part in the largest international airdrop of aid into Gaza to mark the end of the fasting period of Ramadan. 14 aircrafts from nine countries helped deliver essential food and water to civilians. Over a two-week period, the Royal Air Force has dropped over 53 tonnes of aid as the UK works to ramp up deliveries by land, sea and air. And the Princess of Wales is now officially the UK's most popular royal. A YouGov poll found that over 75% of respondents have a positive view of the princess, with Prince William only slightly behind his wife at 73%. Last month, of course, Princess Catherine revealed she's been diagnosed with cancer and is undergoing treatment away from the public eye. And we wish Princess Catherine um, continued good health. There was a programme on Channel 5 last night, which I taped and then went to bed, but um, it was called uh, Catherine and the King. Mm. 
Um, so they had got uh, you know a newly inserted documentary on her. She, she certainly is the woman of the moment. Mm. Uh, ISIS has threatened football fans at the Champions League fixtures this week uh, after their attack at a concert hall in Moscow just a few weeks ago. The Al Azaim Foundation, a media channel linked to the terror group, released this sinister image threatening four stadiums hosting matches, which has led to heightened security. Let's get the thoughts of former senior military intelligence officer Philip Ingram on this one this morning. Thankfully, Philip, things last night all passed without um, incident. Um, what's this going to be like going ahead, going forward? Well, you know, in the UK, we're still under uh, the threat level substantial, which means a terrorist attack is likely. Now, that's not the highest level. It's not the second one down, but uh, it's the lowest level we've been at for quite a while. But it still says a terrorist attack is likely. Um, and the threats that came up from ISIS-K, they were linked to the attack in, in Russia, um, and they've threatened the, uh, the, the, the football games across Europe. Uh, it's there. It's continuing to be there. Our security services so far have continued to keep us safe, not just in the UK, but across Europe generally. But um, we can't ignore this threat, and it's up to every member of the public yeah. to uh, keep their eyes open and be vigilant, and that will keep but all the, of us safe. The, the, dif the differences between here and what happened in Moscow, I suppose, Philip, is you see security there around football grounds. It's quite substantial, and every entrance uh, and exit to a ground will have someone involved in, in searching there. It's highly unlikely that they'll get through there with rifles or automatic uh, uh, rifles or Kalashnikovs or whatever it happens to be. I suppose they could come in and out with, with pistols, but it, it's unlikely to be the same form of attack if it was to take place, I yeah. would have thought. Uh, highly, highly unlikely. You know, the access to weapons and terrorists haven't used um, weapons really in uh, the UK in their terrorist attacks. They have on the continent. We saw the Bataclan in Paris. But in the UK, they tend to um, find that they will use um, your vehicles as a weapon, use knives because you can't get hold of, of guns. But we're focusing on football grounds, on sports stadia. The, the football fans collect in other areas. So um, you're looking, at, looking at it, you've got public transport, you've got railway stations, you've got the cafes, the bars and everything else where fans will congregate beforehand or go to afterwards. These are all what are referred to as publicly accessible locations. Um, and there is a big push to get some form of minimum security standard for publicly accessible locations. Um, the, the Manchester Arena attack in 2017 highlighted that there is no mandatory security requirements for these sorts of places. And Fegan Murray um, uh, has been trying to push to get Martin's Law after Martin Het, her son, who was one of the victims of the Manchester attack, um, Martin's Law brought in. And the government had it in the King's speech, um, but with the potential for um, a, a general election this year, it may not get parliamentary time to, to, to get through. But this is 2024. The Manchester Arena attack was in 2017. Can I ask you, um, we've all got the uh, Moscow attack in the sort of forefront of our minds, and the Americans had sort of got intelligence, hadn't they, that this was happening? They'd warned the Russians and they ignored it. Was that um, intelligence that the Americans got in the same way as we have from this Al Azaim Foundation, that warning? Because I've not seen these sort of media channel warnings before from ISIS, or have I just missed those? Is this a new no, thing they're doing? Yeah, it's, 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 it's unusual for ISIS to pre-warn of an attack. They usually will come in in the media channels and, and claim it very quickly afterwards. But the intelligence game is, is, is you're going on continuously. Um, you know, since 2017, in the UK alone, our intelligence services and counterterrorism police have thwarted 39 attacks. Since 2018, um, nine of those attacks have been what are called late stage. So that's people on their way to carry out something. We never hear about this. Um, so the measurement of success for counterterrorism police and for our security services is nothing happens. But you know, as of today, there are 900 active investigations into about 3,000 people going on as we speak. Um, and that's not people who are on a watch list. There are tens of thousands on a watch list. Those are active investigations keeping our police tied I up. I just don't know how they do it. I mean, so overwhelming uh, that must be. You know, Philip, I, my blood ran cold watching the Moscow concert attacks. I sat in that concert hall three years ago and watched a, a production, and I also did a film behind the scenes. So I knew the whole place and the whole shopping mall area and whatever, and it was absolutely just 
horrendous mm. to watch and, mm. and realise that you knew the area and, and, and with what ease they were able to get in and do things. But, my friend, we know all that from Northern Ireland as well exactly. and, uh, yes. and what goes on. And uh, thanks very much indeed, Philip, for the insight. Much appreciated. We've got to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to go to the weather update. We say good morning. Aidan McGivern this morning. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, a very good morning to you. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office. It's a bright start for many of us, but it will turn increasingly cloudy this morning with more rain to come, especially across western and northwestern parts. That's where the rain is already arriving through the morning. We keep the sunshine in the east at least until lunchtime, but, well, it does get squeezed out by thickening cloud and a freshening breeze along with those outbreaks of rain. The rain will be on and off and mostly light in the south towards the northwest. It'll be heavy and persistent, particularly for western Scotland, where there is a rain warning because of the saturated ground we currently have here. Temperatures up to 15 Celsius, not feeling very pleasant though with the cloud and those outbreaks of rain. However, once the rain does move through, it does turn drier for a time in the south and southeast, albeit with a lot of low clouds, some hill fog. And then we've got further outbreaks of rain across many parts of the country, again, most persistent towards the west of Scotland overnight, but a mild night because of the southwesterly wind and the extensive cloud cover, some places no lower than 12 or 13 Celsius. Now, Thursday morning starts off with those grey leaden skies staying damp and gloomy in the south as well as the far northeast. In between, the cloud does break up for a time, so some sunshine coming through for Scotland, for northeast England, for example, and feeling considerably warmer. Temperatures up to 18 or 19 Celsius in the east before further rain comes along later. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Uh, we'll take a pause. We'll get take a big deep breath now and give you the, the chance to enter our big giveaway, the biggest one of the year so far. Yes, £10,000 in cash, luxury travel items and a 2025 Greek cruise worth £10,000. The total value of £20,000. Here's how it could be yours. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Indeed. Um, stay with us. Still to come, we're going to be looking at the front pages of the newspapers and all the biggest stories of the day in Making the News with Norman Baker and Oscar Reddrop. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. I wonder, is this the fundamental distinction we need to make between Islam, which is a, a, a private religion, people may practice freely uh, amongst themselves, and Islamism? When you try and place those values upon other people, place that, that way of being, force it on people who don't want it. Tom, I have been very much clear about this thing that Islam is a religion and people are free to follow that religion in the UK, in a Western free Western society. So we, we have no problem with people following their religion as long as it is not being imposed mm. onto the wider society and when you would uh, you talk about uh, drawing a distinction between islam and islamism people like me you and me we are drawing that distinction we're trying to maintain that distinction but if you uh, look at the commentator from the muslim community some commentator they would like to blur this line and they would ask you what is islamism where does it exist sorry it does exist mm. we see it and the teacher this incident is an epitome 
of that kind of, you know, ideology being prevalent, you know, in, in our Khadija, society. Khadija, do you worry so, that there are, that these views are typical for some sections of society? Do you think that there's a problem with some Muslim men that they have perhaps uh, views that we don't consider to be British values? There are certain readings of religion which are misogynistic, which are discriminatory, which are homophobic. We need to be honest about it. We need to be calling it out whenever we hear these kind of views. It's been a long time that we are letting these kind of ideologies crawling in, you know, um, spreading tentacles in British society, and we are just ignoring it in the name of respecting people's culture and mm. religion. You are not suppressing the UK. Time quickly approaching 6.35 on this Wednesday morning. Front pages of your newspapers look like this. At the Independence, leading with hero campaigner and former sub-postmaster Alan Bates, saying post office bosses were nothing more than thugs in suits. What a character he was. Yeah. Telegraph leads with the landmark CAS report into gender care for children, and we've been reporting on that. They're saying that pillars of gender treatment built on shaky foundations. Yeah, it's also the top story for The Times. NHS Review rejects use of puberty blockers. Uh, here's the Express. It leads with Conservative MPs declaring the latest ruling by the European Court of Human Rights proves it's time to quit the treaty. We're going to be talking about that next. And The Guardian also on this gender story. Uh, they say thousands of children unsure about their identity have been let down by the National Health Service. Uh, joining us now, we've got Norma Baker. We say hello to Norma. We say hello to Oscar Reddrop for their opinions on things that are happening there. Norman, this European Court of Human Rights and what happened in Switzerland, and people are saying, oh, there'll be repercussions for Britain. Uh, Sunak will have to put it, you know, on a manifesto going into the election if he's going to do it, and Labour won't do it if they're going to win, which looks quite likely that they would. What do, you, what do you make of all of this? We helped create the European Court of Human Rights after the Second World War, so it's a British invention. And the only European countries, I think, who are outside it are Russia and Belarus, which tells its own story. So do we really want to join these pariah states? And this is, this is a kind of Brexit mark too, the idea that we can do what we want in the world and everybody else will follow and, and just let us do it and we'll get all the benefits, none of the disbenefits. That's not how the world works. You know, it's, it's a connected world and the European Court of Human Rights is there to protect ordinary people, you and me, voters across the country, from excessive governments of whatever colour they happen and to be. And that would include uh, all these women in Switzerland who are saying that they couldn't go out for six weeks because there was a heat wave in, in Switzerland. I mean, that's, the, you know, the, the ridiculous comparison that we're, that we're looking at. But the idea is that you get people here saying, yeah, well, there they are, they're interfering in our, our lives, everything mm. like this. We don't want this. Would there be any popularity for that sort of view? Well, I'm afraid that, that you, can, you can find some populist somewhere who will make that case and, and, and stir up the population by misrepresenting what the Euromid Court does. But is there not an argument, Norman, that the ECHR, when it was set up, was for a very different world, where they didn't face a lot of the challenges that we have? have today. And as Robert Jenrick, uh, former immigration minister, has said today that this is just an example of it being expansionist and this is a, a threat to democracy, effectively. Well, it's not a threat to democracy. I mean, I think, look, I mean, of course the world changes and the world's very different to how it was in 1945, not least of all Britain's role, which is entirely minimised compared to where we were after yeah. the Second World War. But, you know, there are certain elemental truths which are always there. You know, honesty, integrity, yes. uh, the right of people to protest, the right of people to have freedom of speech. Those things Things are, are eternal, and that's okay. what the European Court protects. I get protects. that. I get that. But Oscar, I'll put it to you: if we were to put it as a a, a, a vote uh, mm. Uh, mm. to the general public uh, at the moment and say, right, in or out of the ECHR, I suspect. It would be very close, at least. I think you're spot on. I think we heard Rishi talking about it uh, last week, saying that he is prepared to leave. Counterintuitively, on the exact ruling that happened yesterday, this is counterintuitive, because the one judge um, who stood very firm against it was actually British. Uh -huh. um, so for people were saying, well, actually, like you want to remain in these institutions because then you can be the voice of change and the, 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 you, you seek. Um, however, on a campaigning platform issue, um, if we think back to Rwanda, um, that is, I'd say, in terms of weapons in the armoury for Rishi, he has very, very few. To your point, Eamon, in terms of where public sentiment maybe mm. is roughly, that's one of the few 
kind of strings in his bow, I'd say. And Oscar, what really about the is. precedent that this sets? Because mm. we could now see people suing um, the UK or yeah. government if they fail to re that reach the net zero targets that have been set by what the Paris Accord or uh, which net zero targets? Yeah. The government's own targets? I exactly, and that sits very uncomfortably uh, with certain parts of the Conservative Party and that sits very com uncomfortably with certain parts of the electorate and it taps into that very visceral feeling when we look back to the Brexit days. And I know, Norman, you've just spoken about the, 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 the complete dangers of tapping into that. Uh, th those kind of uh, visceral feelings that people have. But it's about shaping your own destiny. And uh, I think yesterday's example, I think people in number 10 will uh, kind of rubbing their hands with glee a little bit, actually. Mm. OK. Mm. Um, we may see it as part of the manifesto. That... We, may, we may do, but I mean, I think, to be honest with you, it's a kind of suicide note if they put that sort of thing in a manifesto. I mean, I think that mm. the Conservative leadership is talking to a smaller and smaller element of the population every day we go on. OK. Let's talk about gender, um, this landmark gender ruling by Dr Hilary Cass. Um, thousands of children, it seems, have been let down since these drugs have been issued pretty much since about 2011, Norman. Um, yeah. And this does seem, and I think the males have got the best headline for me, they say, at last, a voice of sanity. Well, uh, I hate to say I agree with the Daily Mail, but I think... <laughs> I, 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 I think you I, into that one. <laughs> Go on, Norman. I think I do on this occasion, because, I mean, I just... You know, as a Liberal, I take the view that people who are adults who are over 18 can do what, whatever they want with their bodies and whatever they want with their lives. And people under 18 are not fully matured, mm -hmm. not to be protected. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're seeing, in my view, uh, children under terrible pressure from TikTok and everything else um, being led into decisions which are inappropriate and which are often irreversible and cause immense damage to them. So mm. I'm in favour of uh, being very strict on what children can do with their bodies. Yeah, and do you think that there are some very serious questions for these activist charities who've been mm. heaping pressure not only on parents, on the NHS as well, and on mm. all these young people? And if so, what do you do about it? How do you control what these activist organisations are doing? Mm. I mean, it's a hugely contentious issue, obviously. I think it, some of the language in, in the report actually did a really good job of kind of paring that back. Yeah. You're talking... And, and in some ways, it can be a bit woolly, this phrase, but talking about a holistic approach. And I think that's so right. Mm. You know, just kind of slightly easing off that knee-jerk reaction that a lot of these campaigning organisations yeah. have on, you know, medical intervention here, mm. now, straight away. And actually taking that holistic approach, talking to people, that kind of pragmatic compassion. Mm. Um, and I think this is maybe a very important first step in actually just... Kind of strong, exact, it. perfect, perfectly yeah. put. But Norman, yeah. here's my point, and we we had an activist uh, talking about this, uh, and a, a, a man who had gone through this uh, transition, and he's now uh, a woman, right? Uh, half an hour ago on the on the program, and he spoke very, very well about it. But and he was similar age to us, right? And. I was just saying, but where has all this come from and why is it mm. suddenly an issue now? Because, my friend, however sympathetic and you're right about people do what they want with their bodies and whatever it is, when you and I were younger, as teenagers, we wouldn't have been faced with this every day and had six mm. friends and people you went to school with who, who want to be uh, a different sex or, or a pussycat no. or something else. No, we wouldn't do it because the world's entirely different. It's follow on from the previous conversation, as a matter of fact. I mean, mm. you know, the, the impact of, of social media, of TikTok and everything else is, is much more pronounced than it didn't exist in our day. Mm. Um, you know, children are exposed to a whole lot of stuff much earlier in life, including pornography, by the way, which they were never exposed to mm. in our day. There's a whole lot of children on Ritalin, who never on Ritalin. I mean, the, the, you know, there are a lot of challenges for children which didn't exist in the past, and they're not very helpful or, or very conducive to those children, in my view. And this is one of them. But you know, the, they are still people who are growing up and who aren't perfectly formed and haven't formed their own minds properly, and need to be protected from from the mm. wider elements of society. And you know, the, until they're eighteen or you're sixteen anyway, they should be very strictly controlled as to what they can and can't do. We come on to that later on. I think we're talking about whether they should have mobile phones. You know, you can't just let children have everything they want because it's not good for them. OK. Uh, we're just restricted here uh, with the, the break. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to be back and we're talking to the guys again. They're giving their views on all the big stories of the day right after this. The latest GB News Travel.
Good morning, I'm Russell Holding in Cumbria. The A686 is blocked by a shed load of offal at Langwathby to the northeast of Penrith. In Conway, the A548 is closed in both directions to the east of Pentra Isaf because of flooding. A couple of rail lines in Wales where train services are suspended because of flooding too, between Pamphidno Junction and Blyna Fistiniog, and also between Cunliffe and Aberystwyth. In Northamptonshire, there's a report of an accident on the A510 along Northern Way near Great Harrowden. Just outside of Wellingborough in London, the A504 is closed westbound along Priory Road at Muswell Hill because of the burst water main, and buses replace trains between Red Hill and Tunbridge, and that is because of ongoing problems with a landslip. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. Welcome back. We're going through the papers with Norman and Oscar this morning. Um, and Oscar, you want to talk about shoplifting and a big crackdown being announced today. Uh, yeah, this is quite a big story, I think, uh, because it cuts across a few things in terms of when a government latches on to a policy area that actually is at the forefront of people's daily lives often. Uh, so they're investing 55 million in expanding uh, facial recognition systems, including mobile screening vans and kind of mass surveillance. And that phrase in itself is quite contagious. People always, uh, you know, the Orwellian kind of big brother style CCTV get very nervy about that. Um, so I understand that point. However, a, a kind of, I'd say like a, a couple of bullets down in terms of this policy that has slightly gone under the radar is actually a new uh, individual recognised um, law against assaulting shop workers uh, and retail workers. Yeah. And you forget during COVID, which we, you know, four years ago almost, you know, they were key workers that kept us going. And I think, like, a, a specific bespoke law that protects those people, and, of course, this wraparound, you know, surveillance technology will help, I think is... Is, is, is the right thing well, to yeah, do. Well, yeah, but is this wasted money? Because, let's be honest, you spend £55 million installing all of this technology, mm. upset a few people in the process, mm. and then you don't have the police to attend. I mean, they're not even attending yeah. burglaries, let alone shoplifting. I've personally witnessed shoplifting mm. in my local supermarket, and the security guard doesn't even try to stop them. It's just so commonplace now. No, well, shoplifting's been decriminalised, effectively, in this country, um, as, indeed, burglary has been to a large degree, because mm. I don't know what the police actually do. I was on a, a TV program the other day, people saying to me, as a former Home Office Minister, what did the police actually do? I couldn't answer the question. I didn't know what they do. But anyway, so, so we have got mass surveillance instead of police dealing with their job what on the street. Do, Norman. Sorry, it took me a moment to think what they're doing. They're out on these protests every week. Well, some of them are, yeah. Football mm, matches yeah. as well. Yeah, a lot of them are doing that. Mm. Um, that's part of the answer. But look, I mean, uh, it, I, the, the shoplifting is a major problem. Uh, it's, it's, it's developed big time. It's affecting stores. It's partly caused their own problems by all these self-checkout things, so they're encouraging people to take stuff out of the supermarkets. Do they kind of price it in, I, I sometimes feel? They do price it, it yeah. in. Yeah. They do... They, they, they're the calculation that they'll lose stuff out yeah. from shoplifting and they'll save money on employing staff. That's a calculation these supermarkets have made, so they're actually encouraging shoplifting in many ways by the practices they have. They have. In terms of the, 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 the new criminal offence about uh, um, assaulting a shop worker, I mean, of course shop workers deserve proper protection, uh, but, of course, assaults originally 
uh, and now a crime. I mean, and, and the courts can take into account aggravated factors, such as the fact that they're helping the public. So I'm slightly concerned that we're ending up picking and choosing groups of people to protect. I mean, what about railway workers or, or, mm. or people on buses or whatever? You know, they're not especially protected. I just think we have to make sure we've got sufficient numbers of police there yeah, and they treat, the they treat people properly mm. and they investigate matters and charge people when they're committing assaults. Mm. Mm. Um, you want to talk about the, the floods, Oscar, um, in West Sussex well, just um, the past couple of days. We're going to be talking about this towards the end of the programme today as well. Well, just that I don't know if, if you know, viewers, I'd probably take a moment to, if you're, obviously, if you're not directly affected, but if, if, if you're not, just to, to have a look at your, you know, your local, uh, you know, uh, sorry, your na national newspaper or get a TV channel on, um, the images are desperately, desperately sad. And there are, uh, I think the media's done a really, really good job on this. Um, I've, in the media reports I've seen, they've taken individual testimonies from people affected. And I think these are record level water levels. I think over 200 homes have been totally evacuated. And you see the absolute heartbreaking destruction of people's yeah. built lives. Yeah. Um, and it, it is terribly, terribly sad. And you know, I, there was a, an old couple um, who've lived in their house. I was reading the paper for you know something like sixty years, yep. and it's in complete ruins. Yeah. And it's a very, very sad story. Amy. Mm. Uh, well, all very sad. So right, climate change. Uh, yes, maybe, perhaps. Yes, probably. Yeah. But uh, flood defences. I mean, there just isn't the money for them. We're not doing them. I mean, apparently in West Sussex, one side of a, a river flooded. Um, and the other side mm. not because it mm. they had paid for the uh, defences in the, in the area. But the money just doesn't exist mm. in the budget. I wonder if we'll see a... I mean, all I would say is if you're a cabinet minister or someone in the government and someone is advising you to go up there with a broom and mop, don't do it. Well, you don't want that picture. You don't... I, I, you've seen it time and time again. A politician gets sent up to kind of, you know, muck mm. in and help out mm. and they are quite rightly often met with... Why didn't uh, you do more before? This is not a photo op for you, buddy. You know. um, Norman, should we talk about the public finances? Rachel Reeves has been getting lots of um, coverage in the last few days, and she's talking about, well, the, basically claiming there'll be such a mess when they, when, <laughs> if they get into power, that there won't be any relief for public sector workers um, because, you know, there's just. We're broke. Well, famously in 2010, when the coalition took um, took office, there was a note left from Liam Byrne, wasn't it, saying, sorry, there's no money left. Um, and I think the note this time will say, sorry, there's no money left, and here's a big bill for all the money we mm. borrowed. <laughs> um, it's going to be even worse. There isn't any money, and, and Rachel Reeves and her team have made a, a virtue of not committed to any spending beyond Tory spending mm. plans. The Tory spending plans, by the way, also include massive cuts to public expenditure after the election. So unless we're going to see that reversed, we're going to have to have Labour introducing those. It's a bit of a trap for them. Um, and the reality is that um, what Labour's proposed in terms of raising money is, is chicken feed, to be honest. I mean, five billion from, um, from tax avoidance mm. crackdown sounds like a lot of money. It isn't. I mean, that's a fraction of what was lost on PPE equipment, for it's example. It's also very hard to do. To mm. claw back money. Well, I think you can claw it back, and, and it doesn't help that the Treasury's laws are so complicated that there are loopholes appearing here, there, and everywhere. Mm. But you know, the fact of the matter is that tax avoidance is a serious issue, and she's right to identify that. But five billion pounds won't go anywhere. Mm. No. But just, just zooming out a tiny bit, what the Labour Party are very actually, you know, cynically, cleverly, however you want to phrase it, they are not repeating <coughs> past mistakes of previous general election campaigns where it is slow, it is prudent, they don't give an inch for anything that could be seen as, you know, particularly after the green, you know, 28 billion. Yeah. Term, and do you so. think and do you think rather than promise the world, um, they realize they've got a 20 point lead in the polls and they Exactly. They have to promise anything. Be cautious mm. about this. Mm. Yeah, they, they, they can have, they can have fun with this. You know, they have to promise a thing. They just have to be slow, steady, solid, and that's it. Right. Um, Oscar, I don't know how often you, you feel angry, but um, <laughs> here, here's good advice um, about what you should do. Go for a run, take a few deep breaths, scream into a pillow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, are the sort of things, the strategies tried and tested and Japanese scientists have found effective ways of dealing with anger? Where do you stand on those? Not all at the same time. Right, those OK. Things, just to clarify. <laughs> OK. Um, 
<laughs> anger, anger. I'm just imagining you inside Downing Street. <laughs> yeah. There's all this pressure with Partygate yeah. and Boris. Oh, and just... Hang on a minute, guys. I'm just going for a run. I'm just going to sit in a, a dark minute. room, turn all the lights off and, yeah, listen to Moby or something. I think that's probably what, <laughs> how I would deal with anger. But that is, a, that is quite interesting. I think it was a serious point, Eamon. I think uh, anger amongst younger men uh, can lead to unresolved uh, and serious problems. Uh, and, you know, any advice to let it out rather than implode and keep it in? Apparently, if you write healthy. a letter to release your anger, you have to make sure you throw that letter away, or otherwise benefits yeah. stand. Yeah. What, what I would say is that when I was an MP, people used to... Um, in the beginning of my time as an MP, uh, you received letters from constituents. They were letters. Yeah. Mm. And what people were able to do was they write a letter, they get it out of their system, they then tear the letter up and rewrite it and send it into you. Whereas now what happens if you're an MP is someone comes back from the pub at 10 minutes to midnight and sends off a, a Abuse. vitriolic, abusive email, which you wouldn't do if they were having to write a letter. Mm. Mm. Right, right. Let's see so, what yeah, you mean there. Got worse then. Yeah, with that. Are but there any really... Sorry, I was interrupting you then. No. no Are there any, like, little tiny seemingly unimportant things in life that make you more angry than they should. Oh, don't ask that. <laughs> I've opened it. Yeah, I think, gosh, they're, they're, they're a lot. Litter makes me angry. Um, yeah. You know, people... I mean, talking about... Uh, what, what makes me quite frightened is if you go through a town on a Friday night or whatever and you watch a fight outside a kebab shop. I mean, that's really anger that I would never possess. Yeah. There's lots of things that I could have anger for, but wanting to stick a knife in someone yeah. or, mm. you know, a football match as well. I mean, you know, I'm very passionate about football. I don't want to smash yeah, a bottle yeah, over yeah. somebody's head. Yeah. I think road rage is a funny one. I could be driving along in the car, my husband would be driving, he's a mild-mannered, lovely, sweet-tempered person, mm. and then suddenly he's really angry, and I'm like... <laughs> Babe, yeah. what? Yeah. Chill out. They yeah. just pulled out. But you yeah. bring that out in them. No, he. <laughs> he them. I don't. I don't think I suffer with road rage. I get annoyed by other things, but I do think it's funny how the Brits chuckle their manners out the window. When yeah, it yeah, to. yeah. Can I get annoyed by something rather rather minor, but it does annoy me at the time? Stupid announcements on trains. Oh yeah. Um, see it, say it's sorted. I mean, how patronising is that? Yeah, and it goes it, on and on. And and an announcement saying, please take a moment to inspect the safety notes at the end of the carriage. Mm. Who in the world has ever yeah. done that? Yeah. 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 Just shut yeah. up. And especially, they're even more annoying if you're in a nice doze. If you're yeah. just sleeping, mm. and then there's an announcement. And an announcement saying, please be aware this is a quiet carriage. <laughs> please be aware. This, quiet this now. is the weather forecast. <laughs> Ian McGivern, a very good morning to you. What's in store? A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, a very good morning to you. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office. It's a bright start for many of us, but it will turn increasingly cloudy this morning with more rain to come, especially across western and northwestern parts. That's where the rain is already arriving through the morning. We keep the sunshine in the east at least until lunchtime, but, well, it does get squeezed out by a thickening cloud and a freshening breeze along with those outbreaks of rain. The rain will be on and off and mostly light in the south, Towards the northwest, it'll be heavy and persistent, particularly for Western Scotland, where there is a rain warning because of the saturated ground we currently have here. Temperatures up to 15 Celsius, not feeling very pleasant, though, with the cloud and those outbreaks of rain. However, once the rain does move through, it does turn drier for a time in the south and southeast, albeit with a lot of low clouds and hill fog. And then we've got further outbreaks of rain across many parts of the country, again, most persistent towards the west of Scotland overnight but a mild night because of the southwesterly wind and the extensive cloud cover, some places no lower than 12 or 13 Celsius. Now, Thursday morning starts off with those grey leaden skies staying damp and gloomy in the south, as well as the far northeast. In between, the cloud does break up for a time, so some sunshine coming through for Scotland, for northeast England, for example, and feeling considerably warmer. Temperatures up to 18 or 19 Celsius in the east before further rain comes along later. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel.
Good morning, I'm Russell Holding in Cumbria. The A686 is closed each way at Langwathby to the northeast of Penrith. It's because of a shed load of offal. The M62 on Merseyside is closed westbound, where overnight roadworks have overrun between Junction 7 and 6 from Rainhill Stoops to the M57. In Conway, the A548 is closed each way between Pentra Isaf and Thlanfer Talhen because of flooding. And buses replaced trains between Thlindidno Junction and Blyna for Stineog because of flooding. There's no service between McCunlith and Aberystwyth. In Northamptonshire, the A510 is partly blocked by an accident on Northern Way, north of Wellingborough. In London, the A504 Priory Road in Muswell Hill is closed westbound because of a burst water main. And trains aren't running between Barnum and Portsmouth Harbour because of a signalling problem. They're diverting instead to Bogdan Regis. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then, we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel trips for another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Very good morning to you. It is 7 o'clock. It's Wednesday, the 10th of April. Uh, very good to have you on board. Amy and Isabel with Breakfast News here on GB News. A landmark review into gender care has revealed thousands of children let down by the NHS through a shocking lack of research on treatments given to those questioning their gender. Tory backlash against the latest ECHR ruling, which means individuals can sue for a breach of human rights if Britain fails to meet their net zero targets. Yes, among Conservative MPs, momentum is building to quit the ECHR. But what does Rishi Sunak make of it all? Find out more with me very soon. Half past seven, we're going to be talking to the Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, about Labour's plans to breathe new life into the high street. Campaigner and former postmaster Alan Bates hits out at his former bosses as thugs in suits as the post office inquiry reveals the full extent of the scandal and we'll be speaking to a former sub-postmaster, Janet Skinner, in just a moment. And 7.20, young people becoming priced out of the housing market. More and more are relying on the bank of mum and dad. But is that the right way to go? It might be a bright start out there for some of us, but more rain is on the way. However, it will also turn a bit warmer over the next couple of days. Full details with me in the forecast coming up. So our top story this morning, the NHS has been ordered to review gender care for children following a damning and landmark report. Well, this was the CAS review and it found no evidence that the use of blockers which delay puberty led to better mental health outcomes. The author of the, port, the report, Dr Hilary Cass, had this to say. These are all unregulated drugs, you know, they're all unlicensed, whether it's puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones. They're unlicensed drugs used experimentally for children and adolescents with gender dysphoria or gender distress. And so if you're offering these drugs with no diagnosis, no assessment even, um, and no follow-up, no monitoring, no blood tests, then you're, you know, the risk of, you know, patient safety is huge. Uh, an hour ago on the programme, uh, we spoke to diversity and inclusion facilitator Katie John went live uh, and um, she struck a, a big note with a, a lot of you and uh, people saying, um, finally, Anna says, finally someone that talks common sense. Very interesting. Here's what she had to say. 
the whole process, but quite some time ago. Um, and I think the report may, is mainly concerned about teenagers. It's not concerned about adults like me who did it in later years and took a long, long time making up their mind about it. And definitely for someone like me who felt it from a very, very young age. Indeed, Hilary Cass actually does say there is still evidence that it is, can be the right thing for some people who have persistently felt it from a young age. And some of the evidence on um, cross-sex hormones shows that it does leave to somebody having a better life and someone having reduced str uh, distress, etc. She doesn't turn around and, 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 and kind of say that transgender doesn't exist. She doesn't turn around and say that gender identity, gender dysphoria, gender incongruence, whatever you want to call it, and the name changes kind of every edition of the DSM or the ICD, the classifications of diseases. Um, she doesn't say that it doesn't exist. She does say that we need to be cautious, extremely cautious now. Perhaps that's the difference between now and the, and the earlier version and other people's looks at this. We need to be extremely cautious when dealing with kids. Obviously, there's no actual kind of intervention with kids. What we're talking about is teenagers going through puberty and putting puberty on pause. I think the language that puberty goes on pause with puberty blockers is kind of pretty much gone for good around this. Everyone probably acknowledges that if you put a kid, if you put a teenager on a puberty right, blocker... She's not saying it doesn't exist, but she's not saying exactly. it does exist to the extent that it has been listened to yeah. and treated so far. No, exactly. And, and, and she rightly says that, that we need to look at all of the other causes and, and that it is, a, it is a mental distress. And where there are other causes, we need to be really cautious that we're not treating some, some other cause with the, the transgender solution. And, and I 100 percent agree with that. We know that up to three quarters of people who are, are kind of are going through gender distress aren't actually what we would have called transgender in, in the old school kind of diagnosis. The fact that we're diagnosing it younger but then giving an adult treatment to it is is where the kind of the issue is and and she's talking about the fact that there's a, a very kind of constructive i think it's it's constructive many trans people won't and i only speak for myself i don't represent a trans community she sees a, a, a very constructive approach suggesting that this should shift to a cross-disciplinary kind of uh, pediatric basis for this that there should be long-term very slow support she uses the word unhurried which i think is in, in, actually very sensible, it, which we, what we used to talk about 10 years plus back ago was the watch and wait aspect. And, and it needs to be moving back to that. Uh, in reaction to Katie John, uh, David says, what a breath of fresh air to hear her views. Bravo. Finally, someone that speaks with sense in the trans debate, a voice of reason, very measured and balanced. Um, Sean says the number of people with genuine gender dysphobia is probably much rarer than the one in 50 that schools claim to be trans. And that is an issue that... Um, that we will put again uh, to Katie John yeah. when we have her live on the show because um, is this figure uh, blown out of all proportion um, or is it an indulgence? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, and, and there's lots of coverage of this landmark case in the papers, which we'll be covering later on. But just to point to one story inside the mail, which talks from the parents' point of view. They went to see their daughter get a school prize, and it was handed to a boy called Tommy, highlighting uh, the way parents have been kept in the dark as so children have been going through this process. The girl was called and treated as Tommy. At, at school, school, but, was but a girl not at home. the parents were totally unaware mm. of this. So they've set up their own little way of dealing with with all of this. Um, but you see, the business. What do we do with the ones who say, "I'm a pussy cat and I want a tray"? Uh, to what do they do with the tray? Do they poop in the tray or what the heck? What, what, what are they asking for a tray for? Or whatever. So so wait a minute. So then, what happens to these people who say, "I want to be treated as a cat" uh, at the moment? Do they end up cats in life? Or do they get to, you know, six months down the line? Do, yeah, do they common decide? sense has to prevail, and it feels like this landmark case uh, or review certainly is the first time some sanity has been breathed into this debate, which has become so toxic. Is it as widespread as it's made out mm. to be? And uh, should it be as respected mm. as it seems to be in schools and things? Mm. Um, everybody's afraid to cause offence. Mm. Uh, you're watching the channel that's not afraid to cause offence. So get in touch today, gbnews.com forward slash your say.
Uh, now, on to another controversial topic this morning. The Energy Secretary, Claire Coutinho, has led a Conservative backlash against the ECHR, the European Court of Human Rights' latest landmark ruling. So they're based in Strasbourg and they've ruled that Switzerland is violating human rights uh, over their lack of an action on climate change. And this comes after a poll in The Telegraph which revealed that nearly 50% of Conservative voters approve of getting out of the ECHR. Well, let's speak to our political correspondent, Olivia Utley, about all of this. Big questions about what this means for us in the UK. Could we see people suing the government if we don't meet our targets? And also, does this actually, because a lot of people think it's nonsense, give Rishi Sunak a get-out-of-jail-free card, if you like, with his Rwanda plans and say, look, this is nonsense, the ECHR, it's time to get out of it. Well, I think those are two very interesting questions, Isabel. And firstly, yes, I think there is a, a very real chance that this landmark ruling in uh, Switzerland could end up affecting people in the UK. Essentially, what happened in Switzerland is eight older women went to the European Court of Human Rights and claimed that their right to a uh, private and family life, which is protected under the ECHR, had been uh, impinged upon by the fact that the Swiss government hadn't acted quickly on climate change. They said that their particular demographic, older women, were most susceptible to heat waves. And one of them claimed that she hadn't been able to leave her house for three weeks because of a heat wave. Now, the ECHR ruled that indeed their right to a private and family life had been disrupted. And you could see a situation down the line that that ruling is now legally binding. You can see a situation down the line where somebody in the UK, some climate activist in the UK, uh, tries to sue the UK government for not reaching its net zero commitments, which, as we know, are, have now been enshrined in law. That is a situation that the government really does not want to see. And there are plenty of Conservative MPs who are pushing to leave the ECHR. As you say, Isabel, there's another question going on here about whether actually this is quite helpful for Rishi Sunak. Rishi Sunak personally probably isn't too keen on the ECHR because it is the final stumbling block, really, in getting his Rwanda plan, his, his uh, landmark Rwanda plan, through uh, government and actually into action. So could this be a sign that Rishi Sunak is actually shifting the government's position on the ECHR? Previously, the government has been pro for staying in the ECHR. But Claire Coutinho, the Energy Secretary, is a very close personal ally of Rishi Sunak's. If she is beginning to say, isn't now the time to get out, could that be Rishi Sunak testing the ground to see if his party is ready to put that on their manifesto? Well, that's the question we'll put out there um, today and ask you at home watching and listening what you think. Yes. Um, and just put up how they get in touch here. It's gbnews.com forward slash your say. And Helena has already had her say on all of this. She said more people actually die from the cold than from the heat. Is the ECHR also going to rule against countries not doing enough to mitigate against cold weather? Uh, and lots of you also just saying enough is enough. Time to leave the ECHR. Let us know what you think. The post office IT scandal next. Former sub postmaster Alan Bates, he took centre stage yesterday and he said that ex post office executives are little more than thugs in suits, he said at the inquiry. Yes, it's been investigating how the post office wrongly prosecuted more than 900 sub postmasters, all caused by errors in the Horizon IT software system. This is what he had to say. They need disbanding, it needs removing, it needs building up again from the ground floor and as I've been quoted <laughs> quite commonly, the whole of the, the whole of the postal service nowadays, it's, it's beyond, it's a dead duck, it's beyond saving. It needs a, a real big injection of money and I, only, I think that can only happen coming in from outside. Otherwise it's just going to be, it's going to be a bugbear for the government for the years to come. Uh, we can now talk to former sub-postmistress and victim of this whole scandal, uh, Janet Skinner. Janet, hello, good morning to you. When I, when I see you pop up on telly, Janet, I always feel... I, I just feel so sorry for you for all that you went through. Um, they said that you had fiddled 59,000 quid, you were sent to prison for three months, then you were released with a, an electronic tag, uh, but then eventually that whole conviction squashed, um, taken away by the Court of Appeal um, three years ago. The whole stress of that uh, led you to spend time 
in hospital, um, even to the point where you lost the, the use of your, your legs, you were paralysed, you had to learn to walk again. I just, I just have to put it out there for people just, just so they know. That was what happened to you. Awful, awful, awful. I don't know how you rebuild your life after that. Did Alan Bates do anything for you yesterday at this inquiry? I think Alan just said it as it was yesterday and, and and how and what he's been saying for years and what we've all been saying for years. Um, to be fair, I think a lot of us are singing from the same issues in relation to the establishment itself, the way that it's broken. Um, I think... I, I do think it needs reforming. Um but you also have to take into account the, the people who are still running the um, general post offices now. Yeah, it was interesting the way he described um, the post office executives as thugs in suits. And he's been saying uh, over the last few days in interviews as well that he really thinks that these bonuses these executives have been paid should be clawed back. How do you feel about that? They should never have received a bonus. How do you receive a bonus for... Put in thousands of families into poverty, people into prison, people commit suicide. How do you compensate people for that? They're being paid bonuses. It's like they're being compensated for bad behaviour. But not more than bad behaviour, Janet, lying. I mean, these executives, I mean, yesterday in the evidence, it just showed them to be liar after liar, and then coming in front of politicians and making statements, no, I knew nothing about this, no, we were never aware of this, whatever, when tape recordings exist of them being briefed on this very subject. Yeah, well, that was uh, obviously that's from um, Second Sight, and that was the investigation in 2013. And that way, that is when Paula Reynolds had a perfect opportunity to right the wrongs of her predecessors. And all she chose to do was to sit, lie, and just cover up the truth, mm. where she could have dealt with that years ago. So for whatever comes her way now, to, I have to be honest, is her own personal doing. She's got no one to blame for that but herself. Mm. Janet, would you say after what you've gone through and to be put in jail and everything else that, that happened to you, do you think that it's only right and proper that someone who's proven to have lied like that, again, should face a sentence? There's going to be... I think there's going to be a few, and I wouldn't like to see that one person just be scapegoated for the whole thing. A lot of this happened under, under the watch of the Royal Mail. A lot of prosecutions happened under the watch of the Royal Mail. People were sent to prison during that period of time. So, I mean, it was only split in 2012 when the Royal Mail was privatised. Janet, how, how are you, just as we, we leave you? It's one thing, you know, this is a, a moment in time, something covered in the news. We, I tried to outline what you went through. How, how do you get on with your life now? How is your life now? How are you? Um, you have to, you have no choice. You have to get on it. You you either move on or it just breaks you completely. Um, and that happened to me um, like in two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight. Um, I'm actually attending the inquiry on Friday. Um, because there is a there is a number of people that I want to see give evidence. Um, so it's just I'm I'm just waiting for the day that people are held accountable for what they've yeah. done. Well, Janet Skinner, good luck with all that you do um, and I hope that uh, the inquiry goes your way on Friday as you're attending as well. And thanks for telling us your yeah. story this morning. Thank you, Janet. Right, thank you. OK, the time's 7.16. Let's have a look at some of the other stories coming into the newsroom this morning. And the MP, William Ragg, has resigned from the Conservative Party after admitting he gave his colleagues' phone numbers to a suspected scammer. He'll now sit as an independent MP in the Commons. Ragg has claimed he was manipulated into sharing other politicians' personal numbers as part of a Westminster sexting scam. Britain has taken part in the largest international airdrop of aid into Gaza to mark the end of Ramadan, fasting period. 14 aircrafts from nine countries helped deliver essential food and water. Over a two-week period, the Royal Air Force has dropped over 53 tonnes of aid into Gaza as Britain works to ramp up deliveries by land, sea and air.
And the Princess of Wales is now officially the UK's most popular royal. A YouGov poll found that over 75% of respondents have a positive view of Princess Catherine, with Prince William only slightly behind his wife at 73%. Last month, she revealed she's been diagnosed with cancer and is undergoing treatment away from the public eye. Time now for the weather forecast. Here's Aidan McGiven. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, a very good morning to you. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office. It's a bright start for many of us, but it will turn increasingly cloudy this morning with more rain to come, especially across western and northwestern parts. That's where the rain is already arriving through the morning. We keep the sunshine in the east at least until lunchtime, but, well, it does get squeezed out by thickening cloud and a freshening breeze along with those outbreaks of rain. The rain will be on and off and mostly light in the south towards the northwest. It'll be heavy and persistent, particularly for western Scotland, where there is a rain warning because of the saturated ground we currently have here. Temperatures up to 15 Celsius, not feeling very pleasant though with the cloud and those outbreaks of rain. However, once the rain does move through, it does turn drier for a time in the south and southeast, albeit with a lot of low clouds, some hill fog. And then we've got further outbreaks of rain across many parts of the country, again, most persistent towards the west of Scotland overnight, but a mild night because of the southwesterly wind and the extensive cloud cover, some places no lower than 12 or 13 Celsius. Now, Thursday morning starts off with those grey leaden skies staying damp and gloomy in the south as well as the far northeast. In between, the cloud does break up for a time, so some sunshine coming through for Scotland, for northeast England, for example, and feeling considerably warmer. Temperatures up to 18 or 19 Celsius in the east before further rain comes along later. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. It is a Wednesday, that is uh, halfway through the week, hump it's day. It's hump day. Mm -hmm. And um, why do you celebrate hump day? Well, yeah, it's nearly mm. the weekend. Mm. <laughs> it's a bit to go. Week. It's a bit halfway to go. through the week. Um, but anyway, uh, we're going to uh, introduce you once again to our Great British Giveaway competition, and it's really, really good. Yeah, £10,000 in cash, luxury travel items, and a £10,000 2025 all-inclusive Greek cruise. Here are the details. Yeah. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel treats for another chance to win a prize worth over twenty thousand pounds text win to six three two three two text cost two pounds plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to gb04 po box eight six nine zero derby de one nine double t uk only entrance must be 18 or over lines close at 5 p.m on the 26th of april full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand good luck NHS hospitals have been plagued by pests, including rats and oh, no, cockroaches, oh. um, latest figures show. One side, it was said that insects are biting the legs off staff and the whole building has a fly infestation. I mean, you go in with something simple and you emerge with a bubonic plague, yeah. obviously, there as well. Um, these are shocking revelations and another sign of why our hospitals are no longer up to scratch. 18,000 incidents in three years, also including maggots. Oh. Ugh. Nice uh, have you been affected by that story? Let us know, gbnews.com forward slash. You will say otherwise. Stay tuned because we're going to be debating after this whether or not young people who are struggling to get on the property ladder should rely on the bank of mum and dad.
I'm Patrick Christie's every weeknight from nine I bring you two hours of unmissable explosive debate and headline grabbing interviews what impact has that had we got death threats and the bomb threat and so on our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country you made my argument for me my guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story I'm hearing it up and down the country that was a beginning not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Glory De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. House prices, they always seem to be on the rise, don't they? They went up by half percent in the first three months of this year. Uh, it means average house prices have reached a staggering £282,000. Well, look for somewhere in London. Yeah. Nothing begins... See, buy anywhere new in London, it begins at 600000 mm -hmm. That's basically mm -hmm. what you get. For one so, bedroom. One bedroom <laughs> apartment. That's, that's what, you, mm -hmm. what you get. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah. It'd be no shock to many of you that a third of first-time buyers now depend on their parents, mm. the bank of mum and dad, to actually get on the property ladder. Yeah, and how lucky those people are to have that option because, of course, it's not available to everybody. Um, but should we be judging people who do you benefit from the bank of mum and dad? Is it fair that their parents are helping them? Um, there's a bit of a debate around all of this. I mean, who would turn down help from their parents if it's available? Absolutely and why not. shouldn't parents and believe pass me, on their good fortune well, if they've got spare cash? Well, the parents have other things to do with that money. They mm. just have to end up doing what they have to do. Mm. Let's speak to property guru Russell Quirk and broadcaster Anime Mangan uh, about this. Good morning, guys. Well, Russell, what do you morning. think? You know, I, I think it's the natural order of things, I mean, and I, I don't think the bank of mum and dad is something particularly new, really. I mean, you know, uh, quite a while back when I was 18 or 19 and I bought my first property, my dad helped me with a bit of deposit. So I think um, it's it's pretty usual. Um, and of course, look, we should understand that there's a lot of property wealth in Britain. So about 62% of all homes are owned by the occupier. So the majority of homes are owned. Uh, and actually a third of homes don't even have a mortgage. So the equity that we have in UK property is literally in the trillions of pounds. And as a, a consequence, if you're sitting 
there as a 50 or 60 year old with a property worth whatever, six, seven, eight hundred thousand pounds unencumbered. Why shouldn't you take some of that and give it to your children? I mean, frankly, you do it when it comes to their first car. You do it when it comes to their education. It's it's trickle down. And um, I think it's it's absolutely normal and totally and utterly okay. acceptable. Well, let's get the thoughts of Anna May Mangana, mum of four, uh, but you do not think parents should be financially helping their kids out at all? Well, I think it's a sad fact that a lot of parents actually can't help their kids out. So if I won the lottery, I'd buy them a home, a holiday home, a car, <laughs> anything at all they wanted, a ski chalet in Switzerland. But if you don't have those resources, I think it's up to the government um, to have a scheme of these first-time buyers where they lend them 125 even 130% of what the property's worth so they can cover all their costs and get into property without bleeding dry and squeezing the pips of family. And when it comes to the bank of mum and dad, it's a lot of them are subsidiaries. It's godparents, aunts, uncles, siblings who have to chip in because a lot of people, they might have a home, but they don't have the spare cash. Godparents? Yeah. I haven't heard of godparents chipping in to help people <laughs> buy their first property. That sounds very, Desperate very generous. Times. Yeah, mm, OK. Yeah. Well, um, Russell... But do you know what yeah. I think, Anna May? I think um, uh, it's interesting you talk about, you know, there should be governmental help in all of this, but when you look at the market, they just build these apartment blocks. They build them everywhere. They're happening in, in Leeds and Belfast and London, wherever. They're happening everywhere. And they're all being sold or they're all taking bids. They're not, not, not the people who live in the UK. They're all people from China and people from Russia yeah. and people... And, and, and the, the, the thing is, I, I suppose, um, here, Russell, is... They don't care who buys them. Nobody seems to care who buys them as long as they're sold. Well, look, if you're a developer and you build 100 flats for profit, well, then, of course, you don't care who buys them. Um, of course, there's an argument then that, you know, a lot of those properties are left empty. But, look, that's what's called a free market, right? So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Governments, of course, over the years have intervened and, you know, can now charge the owners of those properties multiples on council tax. I actually don't agree with that. You know, I think if you've got the money to buy a property anywhere in the world, you should be allowed to do so. But, sorry, back to Anna May's um, quite interesting and remarkable suggestion that the government should be helping all first time buyers. A, they already the have. Banks. You know, I there, said there actually, I the banks. There, there, there are schemes like help to buy. Uh, and of course, first time buyers up to about £400,000 purchase price don't even pay stamp duty, right? So, so first time buyers. Why should you be paying stamp get... duty at all? That's, well, that's an immoral, totally that's an immoral well, tax well, if ever there was one. I agree. Stamp duty was introduced to uh, fight off. Uh, the threat of war from France back in the 17th century, would you believe? I don't think that's such a threat anymore. So, yes, you're right, we don't need stamp duty anymore. And could um, the government but be a bit I clever with it's... inheritance tax as well? Because you're talking about all this equity tied up in these properties, but a vast proportion of that is going to go to the Treasury when these people die rather than get passed on to the children, which would actually help them uh, be able to help their children. Um, you know, yeah. these, these taxes around property are really not helpful in social mobility. No, but Amy's right. Stamp duty is far worse than inheritance tax. Inheritance tax only applies to about 4% of, of, of people that pass away. Stamp duty, of yeah. course, can notwithstanding just, can I just the fact that you don't, I say something? You're, you're let off the hook as a first-time buyer. Stamp duty brings in £15 billion pounds a year to the Treasury. Yeah. It's Anna? a tax on aspiration. It's a tax on wealth. It's a tax yeah. on... Uh, um, you know, yeah, what I'd like to say is uh, a lot of... A lot of these young people are actually paying rents that are higher than they would be in mortgages. So this, that's why they need the help. That's why they won't then have to fleece their parents. And then I would also add that there's a lot of young people who have a very entitled attitude to uh, their parents helping them buy a flat. They've, a lot of them choose a degree that's Mickey Mouse. They have a job that they choose a job that can't pay to support a mortgage. So th I think there's a reality check here and where they want to live. I mean, obviously, they can't live in prime London if they're only working as a part time music producer. You know, there's a lot of factors here that children have to take the responsibility to um, fund their own lifestyle up to a point. And I mean, and no one has a right that, to I think to parents buy a home. do it because they want little Johnny, who's 40, and well, sat folks... between them on the sofa. We're out of time, folks. We've got to say goodbye to you, but thank you for raising the debate and we'll get put people at home uh, contributing with their comments on all of this. That was uh, Russell Quirk and Anna May Mangan there. Um, stay tuned to GB News Breakfast. Uh, we've got a first coming up. Uh, we're welcoming the Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, onto the channel. Uh, first interview we've done with her. We're looking forward to that. Stay tuned to Breakfast on GB News. The latest GB News Travel.
Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. In Cumbria, the A686 is closed in both directions at Langwathby to the northeast of Penrith. There's a shed load of offal. On the M62 on Merseyside, two lanes are closed westbound where overnight roadworks have overrun between junction 7 and 6 from Rainhill Stoops to the M57, causing delays. In Conway, the A548 is closed in both directions between Pentra Isaf and Fanfair Talhen because of flooding. Buses replaced trains because of flooding between Thindino Junction and Blyna Festiniog. There's no service between Cunliffe and Aberystwyth. With. In Nottinghamshire, the A614 is closed at Farnsfield after an accident. In London, the A504 Priory Road at Muswell Hill is closed westbound because of a burst water main. Buses replaced trains between Redhill and Tunbridge because of a landslip. Trains aren't running between Barnham and Portsmouth Harbour because of a signalling problem. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Glory DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Something that we go on about on this show all the time is the state of high streets. Mm -hmm. and Nail bars, estate agents, but no just parking. The, the things that close up. I mean, mm. I was in Glasgow at the weekend, and actually, pff, I'll tell you what, well, it was no different than Belfast, it's no different than, than anywhere else, Wimbledon, anywhere. You just see <laughs> shops, shops that are that are boarded up. And why is that, and how tough is it? I mean, if someone said to you, Isabel, open up a nail bar, open up a shop in a, on a high street, why would you do it? No, Why would you do it? Rates. Well, Labour are uh, attaching themselves to this one and they think they have a policy about it. And out and about shopping today, the Shadow Home Secretary. We go live to Yvette Cooper. And Yvette, where are you today and why are you there? Morning, Eamon. I'm actually speaking to you this morning from Castleford, where our town centre is being hit, just like many right across the country. Uh, later today, we're going to be in Stockton and talking to uh, residents, talking to shoppers there about the real ways in which our high streets have been hit. As you said, we've had you know banks close, banks pull out of town centres completely. So there's nowhere for people to, for small businesses to be able to take their cash. We've seen shops be boarded up, small businesses under real pressure, and also a complete absence of local police. The community patrols we used to see, all gone. Massive increase in shoplifting, a big increase in attacks on shop workers, big increase in criminal damage in our town centres. So then shoppers don't feel safe and they stay away. This is not on. It's really damaging to the heart of our communities. And that's why Labour is setting out a plan to scrap and replace business rates, to get banking hubs in our towns and to get neighbourhood police patrols back in our town centres so they feel safe again. And how are you going to scrap the business rates? What are you going to replace them with? 
So the idea is to replace the business rates with a much fairer system of business taxation that actually has a proper level playing field between the shops that we see, but also the online businesses that currently you've got online giants that as a result don't pay their fair share. And that means you've not got a level playing field that those high street shops that we want to support end up being penalised. And that's why we have to have a new system in place. Of course, we'll need to consult on that and Rachel Rees will be our Labour Shadow Chancellor, will be leading that process. But we have been clear, we just have to end this failing system of business rates that's hitting our town centres so hard. I think that is real politics because that is real life that you're talking about. And I often, I look at this and I think nobody cares. Nobody cares if the local optician uh, is forced out of business to be replaced by a Tesco Express. It's always the big, the big companies get in their boots and Tesco and, and whoever else it happens to be. And the small independent traders, no one cares, mm -hmm. no one's there acting for them, greedy landlords. So we've got all that, we get all that picture there. But economically, um, I can see the, what this does to your heart and your soul and the way you view your locality. But business-wise as well, does it cost the economy what's happening? I think it really does. And, and you know, Eamon, I think people do care. I think people do care if they lose their local shops, local businesses. And, you know, we just know in the heart of our towns, we've got the local market traders, the local small businesses, they're the people who are actively involved in the local high street. Actually, people often very often want small supermarkets in their town centres and so on as well. That is really important. And, you know, all of us need to be able to go to supermarkets as well. But you're right that those small businesses, that can be really what drives the local economy and yeah. it's about both the local economy yeah, I, and I think, I think you're right about people caring absolutely agree people care I'm not sure that politicians care or they can care local councils for example um, parking is a massive issue that I think you have to tackle in the that all all that you're doing here as well and I think rather than employ parking uh, wardens, people who prevent parking happening, there should be parking facilitators, there should be people on the street saying, right, Mrs Cooper, in here, if you, I can give you 15 minutes here, as long as you're out in 15 minutes and da -da -da, and they find a space for you and the street moves on. And a friendliness instead of a hostility, you're not welcome here, you can't park here, don't get out here. That's, that's what I think. Well, you definitely want people to feel welcome in the town centres, but that's one of the reasons we're pushing for 13,000 more neighbourhood police across the country, including guaranteed town centre patrols, because actually one of the things that is keeping people away and that means that town centres don't feel friendly is if you've got uh, anti-social behaviour, persistent problems, or if you have shoplifters repeatedly getting away with it because it's often being driven by organised crime, this 30% yeah. increase just in the space of a year in shoplifting and people just getting away with it time and again yeah. because there aren't the neighbourhood police there. So, so I actually think that's about making people feel safe and friendly and it being welcoming in our you town centres as well. problem keeping people out of uh, the town centre as well, uh, a labour policy here in London. But I want to talk to you about a couple of landmark um, decisions that have been made in the last 24 hours. First of all, this one that's come out of the ECHR yesterday, uh, which will have an impact here uh, on our own laws in this country. It's almost like the Brexit argument again. Should foreign judges have jurisdiction over our laws? This is all about climate change. Now people can use human rights laws to say, hang on a minute, the government has failed me and they're not reaching our net zero targets. Do you think it's time to pull out of the ECHR? Well, no, the thing is, look, the, the Tories will always do this. They always would look for something else to blame and something else to distract from their chaos. And, you know, it's not the ECHR that means we've got a crisis in our NHS or that we've got real problems with energy bills shooting through the roof and not being brought down, which part of tackling climate change. So, you know, that's they're just sort of looking for something else to blame. The thing about the ECHR is that it's part of the Good Friday Agreement, and we need to maintain the Good Friday Agreement and the peace settlement that was reached many years ago and that needs to be maintained. And it's just about having 
proper international standards we expect all countries to meet. But I think very often this is used as a distraction from the real problems, which is, you know, look, let's get our economy go growing properly again. Let's tackle the cost of living crisis. Let's tackle the crisis in our NHS, all things that Labour wants to yeah. do that, frankly, the Tories are failing all to right. do time. Yeah. And very briefly, because I know you have to go, but you mentioned the NHS there, and I just want to ask you about this landmark CAS review, which has showed that a generation of children, thousands of them, have been let down in the way they've been treated for, for gender crises that they've been facing. Do you think that there need to be serious questions asked in many cases of these activist organisations that have heaped pressure on parents, on the NHS, and indeed on children? And if so, what can be done about it? Well, I think this is a really important report, the CAS report. I really welcome it. And Labour accepts all of the recommendations. We think they need to be implemented as rapidly as possible. Children and young people have been badly let down. That is what the report finds, because the support for young people has not been based on evidence. It, and it's really important when you've got children and young people's welfare, there has to be proper evidence-based you know, support. There has already been changes made around things like puberty blockers, but we need to make sure that we go further and actually implement the findings of the CAS report. It's, it's a really serious, thoughtful report, and I hope the government will now implement it as rapidly as possible. Well, Shadow Home Secretary, it's the welfare of the High Street for you today. Good luck on all the places you're visiting today. And uh, it's for the community, it's for shoppers, it's, it's for everybody, it's for, for the heart and soul of, of communities. So good luck and thank you very much indeed for talking to us today. Uh, still to come, Norman Baker, Oscar Redrop will be here looking at what's making the news in the papers. See you in a moment. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. There is a, a, a kind of a Mediterranean side to that as well, because my mother came from that side, you know, a, a big family. And I think there is that sense of community where family is kind of key. And I think that's really kind of what we sort of try and continue, really. I mean, certainly with children and stuff like that, you know, the Sunday lunches were always, you know, the big thing. Yeah, <laughs> really. but if you go down the old camp road today. Very different. Very different, yeah. And that was quite some time ago as well, because we were very close to where the Thomas Beckett was. Yeah, I know. There. I know, the and, boxing um, upstairs and all yeah, the rest of it. Yep, 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 yep. And, um, and I did go down there not so long ago, actually, and it really is very, very different. I mean, I'm not saying that's necessarily bad. I think we have a different view of things. In that Most sense. people in London, Nicky, don't even know the names of the next-door neighbours. No, true. We've that's completely true. lost that sense of community that you grew up with, yeah. that you knew. I think it's a real problem. Yeah, I mean, I have to say sometimes I'm a bit guilty of it where I am now as well. You live in big houses, and yeah, I yeah. do see my neighbours, but, you know, it's not quite the same as it was back. Now, I guess from that background, you're a teenager, you want to become a hairdresser. Yeah, that's, That must that, have been that, quite a difficult call. Yeah, that one was a really good, a really good call. My dad went, oh, God, what? I mean, it was just very funny. And, and certainly from the point of view of, you know, this was the early 70s. And yeah. So it wasn't really the kind of the choice of most, that most people would do. No, but you did. But why? I don't know, actually. I mean, actually, I went to a grammar school and um, I didn't do as well in the final um, uh, exams. And I was kind of forced into sort of leaving. And you suddenly go, ooh. No idea what to do here, really. Yeah. But the idea of doing something in fashion. And, you know, I really kind of... I, I know that I was given some really good advice, actually, by somebody that said, just start at the bottom. Don't necessarily go to, you know, college or whatever. Not, there may not be anything wrong with those, but just start at the bottom. Go to the best place you can and start sweeping the floor. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Norman Baker and Oscar Redrop, their opinions on the stories that are the floating about in the news today. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Norman, um, Lord Cameron uh, was in America the past few days. He met uh, President Trump and he, uh, he wasn't uh, greeted in, in the US House of Representatives. No, I mean, look, I mean, it's a very difficult visit for him because he's on record as saying that Trump is misogynistic. Um, uh, Trump welcomed him in. It wasn't the problem. Hmm? He didn't have a problem with Trump. Trump well, he did. I mean, I, I think he probably did, did, did a problem with Trump because he had to go to Trump because the Republican Party is under the control of Trump. And he has to, therefore, try to get Trump to get the Republicans to agree to some aid being released for Ukraine or, indeed, to think about what might happen, heaven forbid, if Trump wins the election in November. But he's on record, Cameron, as, as being very critical of Trump, quite rightly, in Literally my view. Literally on the record. That was the name of his book. Did you do that? Yes. I, yeah, indeed. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, you know, and the, you know, Trump is a mercurial person and he's, and he's mm. completely narcissistic and uh, he's very difficult to deal with. But Cameron had to go and see him. But the point is that the Speaker of the House, uh, Mike Johnson, um, didn't meet Cameron because he's been threatened with being removed from office by some of his more extreme Republican colleagues in the in the in the House mm. if he meets uh, if he if he gives way on on Ukraine. So is this going to happen, or do you think Ukraine needs to give up on this aid package? And what does that mean for Ukraine? Because it's a huge amount of cash that they're blocking at the moment. It's a huge amount of cash, but I mean I think that uh, Zelensky himself has said, and I think he's probably right that unless you get some money from the U.S. You know, it's probably game over at some mm. point because the Russians have got endless amounts of money, and Putin doesn't mind how many Russian soldiers die in the process. Mm. I think Trump doesn't yeah. like giving any money. He doesn't, no. Well, I think that is the brutal reality. I think Cameron, uh, and we were talking in the green room, me and Norman, you know, whatever your political beliefs, I think Cameron is, is a bit of a class act, actually. And I think that does rob people up some... I heard him described as a Rolls-Royce. Yeah, he is, he, is, he, does, he is a Rolls-Royce politician in many ways. And I think he's actually been in quite confident mood. I think he, you know, he's got his feet under the desk and I think he, he, he has kind of excelled, actually, on a number of the huge um, global issues of the day. And I think that confident spirit probably raised expectations as to what was actually possible with this visit. Um, and I think they've probably come down a peg or two and have been dampened a little bit. Um, I don't think it's the last we've heard of it. I wouldn't be surprised if Cameron um, and the UK do their best to head out there again, because, as you rightly say, the brutal reality is, without that US aid mm. package, Mm. It, things are looking really, really, really mm. difficult for Ukraine. Well, which ties on to this next story about China and Russia uh, pledging a more active ties uh, in their support for um, the war, well, mm. for Moscow's position in all of this, um, which is a worrying alliance, really. It's the most worrying alliance. And I know that we, you know, sometimes suffer from... Uh, kind of lethargy when it comes to the, the war in Ukraine. You know, it's been it's been quite some time now. And when you see these uh, kind of allegiances strengthening across the world, you realise just how important the issue is. And I know that viewers at home, and we talk through these stories every single day of mm -hmm. things that are on their doorstep and immediately important to them, and I completely get it, but we must not forget about the situation in Ukraine because it oh. will deeply impact and affect us all. Yeah. You will see so many former British <laughs> army chiefs, you know, <clears throat> Uh, intelligence, people very high up in intelligence saying, like, we are, a, we're in a pre-war Although increasingly era. we hear people saying on this programme they think it's a money laundering <coughs> exercise on behalf of Ukraine and it's a scam and we shouldn't oh, support it. That's very dodgy ground. Very I think the, the China thing is interesting because what's, what's China will be very pleased with what's happening in Ukraine because, mm. first of all, Russia's become more, more dependent on China and China's the, the, the country that's in charge here, not Russia. So that's a very happy situation. <laughs> Secondly, China wants to see what happens with the West and whether or not they can get Taiwan back and that's mm. the consideration in their heads. OK. Norman, when I was young, sardines were <laughs> a regular feature of uh, cuisine in the Holmes household. <laughs> um, and they were a, a cheap sort of commodity. And now that I'm older, the only time I eat sardines are in posh restaurants. Um, so strange, so they become a preserve of the, the rich, is what I'm trying to say. Well, not necessarily. I mean, I, I might <coughs> say that um, for, a, for a quick lunch at home, tin sardines on toast is actually rather good. Yes, yeah, very nice, very, very nice. And I'm out of the habit of doing that, and I must get back into it. Why should I be doing it? Well, according to the paper, this is The Guardian, uh, swapping red meat for sardines could save... <coughs> 
750,000 lives a year. This is a report that's been produced <coughs> by, by investigating 137 different countries. So it's quite an extensive report. More of our Japanese so this scientists. Is 750 might say. around the world. Then, yes, indeed. Yeah. Because red meat is deemed to be uh, unhelpful for your body, and uh, forage fish, as they call it, sardines and other oily fish, anchovies and herring, uh, are good for you. So the recommendation that both for the environment and for your personal health, moving towards eating uh, oily fish yesterday, away from red meat, a good idea. Yesterday it was camel milk, and today it's. <laughs> Stinky oh. fish, yeah, to replace cows. What, what, what are forage the planet? Fish? What is a forage so, uh, fish? Yeah. We're going to disagree on that, Norman. I think oh. that is. I think red meat is a wonderful thing. I think as long as you don't eat it, you know, every. As long as you day. don't eat it. Well, no, no <laughs> it's, it's good for you. Red red meat's very very good for you. All that protein and. There's nothing well, uh, not, not, not exactly. according to this report, it's not because it's, it's mm. linked. The with only the... thing about sardines is bones. The, the, bones. Yeah, yes. bones. If you yeah. can get rid of the skeleton. They're fine. And anchovies are a bit furry as well. Uh, mm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's furry. quite a good way of describing <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. I don't like that. But, um, well, the bones just come out. If you, if you cook properly, you just remove the bone in one go. With the yeah. 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 No, I like both sardines. I like anchovies. That's no difficult. Herring, I'm not... Uh, so Herring are more difficult with. to deal with. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, but very good. Uh, football match, Champions League it was last night. And, uh, again, um, tonight, this Islamic State threat... Um, uh, about security at um, a lot of these matches. Uh, what, what's your take on that, Oscar? Uh, hugely serious, not to be taken lightly. Um, the noises that have come out of the intelligence services uh, are saying exactly that. Uh, in a lot of the media coverage, and, I, and I, I don't mean this, I'm not making light of it, but I, I never know what this really means. It's, you know, it's for urging football fans to stay vigilant, and you kind of go, well, I'm not quite sure what they're supposed to do. I don't really know what that, you know. Well, uh, if you uh, see somebody with a clash in the cough, <laughs> yeah, then probably, you know, you probably want to be a bit more vigilant in that in that circumstance. Um, it's hugely concerning, and it talks to the stories that we've just been talking about. This, the world is becoming more increasingly dangerous. Um, and I, I know... Uh, you watch football from the, you know, the, the, the comfort of your own home a lot of the time these days, but there is nothing better, there is nothing better than watching the Champions League, you know, in, of an evening, live in the stadium, and, you know, stories like this are hugely troubling. Yeah. Mm. Um, Norman, we, we talked about um, the infestation in a lot of hospital wards. It's front page of the Metro yes. um, today. What do you think of that? Well, this is a, a horrific. This is actually a period... I didn't know this at the time, but this is a Lib Dem freedom of information request that's produced all this, but 18,000 pest cases in three years, cockroaches, flies and maggots, insects biting legs of staff. I mean, the details are just horrific. Yeah. And um, if anyone's having breakfast at home, I'm sorry about this, but, <laughs> I mean, just details about um, maggots in the mortuary, rat droppings oh, in the no, body bag... No, uh, ..silverfish in the doctor's canteen, uh, ant infestation in the maternity ward. OK, right. we get the message, we get the message. Hope your hospital's a bit cleaner than all of that. Here's Aidan McGiver. Good morning. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, a very good morning to you. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office. It's a bright start for many of us, but it will turn increasingly cloudy this morning with more rain to come especially across western and northwestern parts. That's where the rain is already arriving through the morning. We keep the sunshine in the east at least until lunchtime, but, well, it does get squeezed out by thickening cloud and a freshening breeze along with those outbreaks of rain. The rain will be on and off and mostly light in the south towards the northwest. It'll be heavy and persistent, particularly for western Scotland, where there is a rain warning because of the saturated ground we currently have here. Temperatures up to 15 Celsius, not feeling very pleasant, though, with the cloud and those outbreaks of rain. However, once the rain does move through, it does turn drier for a time in the south and southeast, albeit with a lot of low clouds and hill fog. And then we've got further outbreaks of rain across many parts of the country, again, most persistent towards the west of Scotland overnight, but a mild night because of the southwesterly wind and the extensive cloud cover, some places no lower than 12 or 13 Celsius. Now, Thursday morning starts off with those grey leaden skies staying damp and gloomy in the south as well as the far northeast. In between, the cloud does break up for a time, so some sunshine coming through for Scotland, for northeast England, for example, and feeling considerably warmer. Temperatures up to 18 or 19 Celsius in the east before further rain comes along later.
Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. In Cumbria, the A686 is closed in both directions at Langwathby to the northeast of Penrith because of a shed load of offal. In Conway, the A548 is closed each way because of flooding between Pentra Isaf and Thanfair Talhen. Buses replaced trains pulling from Glendale Junction and Blamer Fistiniog because of flooding. And also, no trains running between Cunliffe and Aberystwyth. Now, trains have been stopped between Moose Cardiff International Airport and Bridge End because of the trespasser. In Nottinghamshire, the A614 is closed at Farnsfield after an accident. In London, the A504 is closed westbound along Priory Road at Marswell Hill because of a burst water main. Buses replace trains between Redhill and Tunbridge because of a landslip. And trains aren't running between Barnham and Portsmouth Harbour because of a signalling problem at Hilsey. They're diverting instead to Bognor Regis. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Glory DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Hello there, very good morning to you. The time, very nearly 8 o'clock on this Wednesday, the 10th of April. Welcome to Breakfast with Eamon Holmes and Isabel Webster. Good to have you with us. Leading the news this morning, a landmark review into gender care has revealed thousands of children have been let down by the NHS through a shocking lack of research on treatments given to those questioning their gender. A Tory backlash against the latest ECHR ruling, which means individuals can sue for a breach of human rights if Britain fails to meet net zero targets. Heightened security at football matches in England, Spain and France despite terror threats from Islamic State. And our debate at 20 past eight with France now issuing five euro fines to anyone who misses a GP appointment. We're asking if it's time the NHS followed their example. It might be a bright start out there for some of us, but more rain is on the way. However, it will also turn a bit warmer over the next couple of days. Full details with me in the forecast coming up. Uh, we're about to hear uh, from the Conservative Party today an announcement on a crackdown on retail crime and shoplifting. 
Uh, well, we're joined by Parliamentary Under Secretary for Justice, Laura Farris. And uh, welcome to the programme. Good morning to you. We'll talk about all of that in just a moment. But if you don't mind, we'll start with our top story this morning, which is this landmark CAS review into gender identity, which shows that since around 2011, the NHS has been failing thousands of youngsters. Is this the big health scandal of a generation, do you think? Well, Dr Cass has done unbelievable work on this review. It's the first, far, by far the most comprehensive review of this nature. She spent nearly four years writing it and she produced an interim report two years ago, which has already been informing government policy. But look, yes, she's identified some really, really serious issues. One thing I think that your viewers should know, though, that in 2011, 250 children were referred for gender identity services. By 2021, that number had climbed to, to more than 3,500. And that's been happening in many similar countries across the West. So, yes, there has been this sort of very unprecedented demand for a service that really hadn't had much demand at all in the last decade or so. And she has uncovered some very, very serious matters that have been, um, that have resulted from that. She's identified in particular um, that there could be questions for activist charities who've put pressure on the NHS, on parents and indeed on pupils to rush through this process when they are still children. Do you think more needs to be done to yeah. ensure that there isn't this pressure, that things are slowed down, that these activist charities don't have all this power? I think you're, you know, I think in many ways you're summarising what she's been saying and you're getting to the absolute kernel of her report because she said this in her interim report. <coughs> she talked there about primary and secondary health providers, doctors, who fell under intense pressure to adopt an unquestioning affirmative approach. In other words, when they were confronted with a child, maybe 14 or 15, who said they were questioning their gender, that they felt obliged to start them down a pathway, potentially to irreversible, you know, um, either medication or surgery that that person might as an adult come to regret but they felt they had no choice but to do that and right at the heart of her proposals I mean you'll you'll be aware the Tavistock clinic which used to be the only provider of children's gender services has been closed down the NHS are no longer prescribing puberty blockers to children we on the back of Hilary Cass's interim report issued schools guidance which was very very clear about what schools should and shouldn't be doing and so yes in answer to your question this is a detailed, empirical, scientific review that should inform the way that policy is developed and it shouldn't be a matter of trends or feelings or social cachet on how but this I, very sensitive issue is But developed. I suppose the, the question then is, that you know, has the government been too slow to prevent all of these cases being pushed through, given these findings? Could you have been quicker? And have you yourselves, having been in power since 2010, had some part to play in failing these youngsters? I don't accept that, and I make that point very gently and respectfully. As I said, there has been a 20-fold, something like a 15 or 20-fold increase in the number of children being referred to this service in the last 10 or 15 years, and that's happened in many countries, many other countries. It's a problem everybody's been grappling with. We're the government that asked Hilary Cass to conduct that review. She spent three and a half years doing it. There is nothing comparable in any other country that is remotely as in-depth as this. And we did it because we were worried about what was happening and we were worried about the way that certain NHS procedures were happening. And it's been incredibly helpful to hear from doctors, from mental health experts, and to look at the way that she recommends that this should be dealt with holistically on a regional basis, on a multidisciplinary basis, where sometimes children have problems with neurodiversity like autism or they've got a mental health crisis in the background, that all of that should be explored and treated before you go anywhere near irreversible gender change drugs. And so actually I think we've acted responsibly. We've recognised how it was emerging with the concerns that people were raising, even though there was pressure on us actually to accept this. Uh, we've done this detailed piece of work and we'll be reading it incredibly carefully and I anticipate it will inform some of the work that we do going forwards. Well, Laura, um, you're in the Department of Justice yep. and you're also getting tough with yep. shoplifters. Tell us more. Yeah. Yeah, so today we are announcing a new standalone offence of assault on a retail worker. And, of course, assault is already an offence, but we are doing this because even though we have seen crime falling really sharply in the last 15 years since we came in, violent crime is down by 51%, neighbour... 
neighbourhood crime, stuff like burglary, car theft, um, uh, theft from a person has, is down by 48%. The one stubborn area where we have seen an increase is shoplifting. And what often goes with that is assault on a retail worker. So we're introducing a new freestanding criminal offence that will come with its own bespoke set of sanctions that will be specific to this kind of offence as a clear signal that this is a zero tolerance offence and we are standing uh, you know, right beside those who work in public facing retail roles. I get that, I get that, but a lot of people will say they work in security in stores, department stores, and if they catch an offender, uh, they phone for a police officer and the police are not available or not interested in, in turning up and dealing with all of this. So you can make it a standalone statutory offence and that'll get you a headline today and everybody said, oh, you're getting tough, but you're not really, are you? Because you haven't got the police resources to deal with all of this. Well, let me just answer, break that down and answer your questions. First of all, police numbers are higher today than when we came in in 2010. They're at very close to record highs. The second thing is that we've been working really intensively on this issue. It is true to say that if you went back maybe a year and a half, there was an issue about police attendance. But we've been working really, really closely with the police. If I can give you one illustration of what that looks like. Last year, we saw a 32% increase in reported shoplifting incidents. But we saw 34% more prosecutions going into court, which showed that the police were keeping pace with that. My um, colleague, the policing minister, Chris Philp, has been working on a retail action plan specifically with with police and actually um, when we've looked at the results of that we've seen that more than 70 percent of forces now are responding to at least two-thirds of all shoplifting reports and nearly 20 percent of forces are responding to 100 percent of them now of course you'll say well there's further to go on that yes there is but it is the case that the vast majority of shoplifting responses are today being responded to and that's why we feel comfortable to introduce this next stage okay. but you see laura i i you know i love you you, you say their police numbers have never been higher and yet response to burglaries have never been lower. Response to car crime is practically written off. Mm. Could you just sort of explain to me how your numbers are up and yet these other things go down the list of priorities as to what police officers should be attending to? Well, I do not accept that we are deprioritising any of these things. Our police numbers for England and Wales are currently 149,000. That is very close to the highest it's ever been. In fact, it was its highest in March 2023. Yeah, much less experienced kind of officers, though, than then. you had when you came into power. And also a, a larger population. So as but, a percentage let me just of the come population, back. there are fewer officers. Oh, only, only very, very slightly. Let me just come back to your point on domestic burglary. We take our crime statistics from the gold standard of crime reporting. The Office of National Statistics relies on the Crime Survey of England and Wales. The reason is that that surveys individuals, victims, just to ask them about their experience of crime rather than looking at police reports, because we know not every crime gets rep mm. reported. That shows that since we came in in 2010, neighbourhood crime has fallen by 48%. That includes domestic burglary. Violent crime has fallen by 51% and crime overall, excluding fraud and computer misuse, is down by over 50%. Maybe, so we maybe have been people aren't reporting it because it's not worthwhile. Reducing. Yeah. OK, Laura, that's I understand... Not what we're, that's not what we're hearing. Well, it's not what you're hearing, but I'd love you to hear what we're <laughs> going to hear today because yeah. we're going to put that out there and we're going to ask people for their experiences in this. And I bet you, Laura, it doesn't <laughs> match up to yours. But, however, thank you very much indeed. Well defended, case well put, and good luck with what you're trying to do. Thank you very much indeed. Laura Farris is a Parliamentary thank Undersecretary you. for Justice. And uh, what you've got to do is get in touch here by put that scrap up yeah, there. GBnews.com forward slash your say. Uh, so have your say as regards if someone's stolen your car, have the police responded to it? Were they interested in it? If they burgled your house, mm. were the police interested in it? Uh, the Justice Secretary saying there that uh, down by 48% and 51% mm. these things. I would suggest not in real life. Mm. I would suggest that a lot of people go, what's the point of phoning the police? They're not going to do anything about this. Um, let us know what you think. ISIS have threatened fans at this week's Football Champions League fixtures just weeks after their attack at a concert hall in Moscow. The Al Azim Foundation, a media channel linked to the terror group, released this sinister image threatening four stadiums hosting matches last night, which led to heightened security. Let's go to our reporter, Charlie Peters, who's at the Emirates Stadium in London. Charlie, it went well last night, though. 
That's right, Eamon, the first quarter-final for Arsenal in the Champions League since 2010. And football was the headline here in a two-all draw after the Metropolitan Police put in a robust policing plan to reassure those attending this fixture. They said that there was no specific threat that they were aware of. And police officers I spoke to here last night said that their plan and their strategy for the evening was nothing out of the ordinary. No additional measures had been taken to deal with that supposed threat after a website close to ISIS, a de facto aligned media organisation, shared a graphic with a man wearing a balaclava and holding a rifle in front of several stadiums in Europe that are hosting matches this week. But tonight, PSG are hosting Barcelona in Paris. And we also have Atletico Madrid hosting Borussia Dortmund. Now, on the continent, we know that European security officials and ministers are taking more stringent measures to respond to those threats. In France, the security level in reaction to the attack in Moscow at the end of last month has been raised to the maximum level after 137 people were killed. The French interior minister said yesterday that their policing response ahead of the game has been considerably reinforced. The Spanish sports minister, by on, on the other hand, has said that they are going to issue a message of calm but has sought to reassure the public that 2,000 police officers and members of the Civil Guards Defence will also be on duty. Thank you, Charlie. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. OK, we're going to talk about the ECHR this morning. This is a topic that gets you all hot under the collar. Uh, the Energy Secretary, Claire Coutinho, has come out and led a Conservative backlash against the latest European Court of Human Rights landmark ruling, this time relating to Switzerland, but it could have an impact here in the UK. Well, the ECHR is based in Strasbourg and it's ruled that Switzerland is violating the human rights of people over their lack of action on climate change. Last night on GB News, Jacob rees <clears throat> hit out at the ECHR. The court makes a mockery of rights because it removes that fundamental democratic right of voters to change the law under which they live. That's why it is now time to leave. Our rights have always come from Parliament, not from unelected judges in Strasbourg who make up the law as they go along. Um, earlier, the Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, said we couldn't do that, and here's why. The Tories will always do this. They always would look for something else to blame and something else to distract from their chaos. And, you know, it's not the ECHR that means we've got a crisis in our NHS or that we've got real problems with energy bills shooting through the roof. Mm. Well, she said it's part of the Good Friday Agreement, and that's mm -hmm. why uh, we are uh, joined to it. Here's a political correspondent, Olivia Utley, with her take on all of that. ECHR, will it be a, a manifesto commitment this year? I think it is just possible that it does end up being a manifesto commitment. There are plenty of Conservative MPs who have been saying for a long time now that they think the only way to get that Rwanda legislation actually implemented is to leave the ECHR. Suella Bravman, when she was Home Secretary, said that it was her personal wish to leave the ECHR. But until now, at least, the government's uh, official position has been that Britain must stay in the ECHR and reform it from the inside. This landmark ruling could end up uh, being the straw that breaks the camel's back. It is a pretty significant ruling. There were eight older women in Switzerland who uh, took the government in Switzerland to the ECHR, took them to court and said that because they are particularly susceptible to heat waves as older people, uh, they have been uh, denied their right to a private and family life because the Swiss government, they say, hasn't acted fast enough to stop stop climate change. Now, that is a legally binding position, the ECHR's ruling, and would trickle down into the UK. So you could genuinely have a position where climate activists end up suing the government for not reaching its net zero commitments. Now, Claire Coutinho, the Energy Secretary, has said that that is concerning. She is a very close personal friend and ally of the Prime Minister. Is it that Claire Coutinho is testing the ground, testing the water, to see whether proposing leaving the ECHR ends up being popular among the general public. And if it does end up being popular among the public, it could well end up 
on that manifesto. The Conservatives know that these local elections are coming. They are going to be very brutal indeed. And there are plenty in government thinking now is the time for bold action for that final roll of the dice. Thank you, Olivia. We'll leave it there. On the news on this Wednesday morning, former sub-postmaster Alan Bates has told the Horizon IT inquiry that the post office spent 23 years attempting, in his words, to discredit and silence him. The inquiry has been looking into what led to the wrongly prosecution of more than 900 sub-postmasters, all caused by errors in the system. Mr Bates has been giving his version of events ahead of appearances by senior executives from the post office as the week progresses. Britain's taken part in the largest international airdrop of aid into Gaza to mark the end of the fasting period of Ramadan. 14 aircrafts from nine nations helped deliver essential food and water to civilians. Over a two-week period, the Royal Air Force has dropped over 53 tonnes of aid into Gaza. Princess of Wales is now officially the most popular royal. A YouGov poll found that over 75% of people have a positive view of Princess Catherine, with Prince William slightly behind his wife at 73 per cent. Last month it was revealed she had been diagnosed with cancer and is undergoing treatment. It's chilly in here, isn't it, this morning? I don't know what the weather's doing outside. I haven't seen any daylight. Is it raining? Is it sunny? Aidan McGiven has your forecast. <laughs> A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, a very good morning to you. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office. It's a bright start for many of us, but it will turn increasingly cloudy this morning with more rain to come, especially across western and northwestern parts. That's where the rain is already arriving through the morning. We keep the sunshine in the east at least until lunchtime, but, well, it does get squeezed out by thickening cloud and a freshening breeze along with those outbreaks of rain. The rain will be on and off and mostly light in the south towards the northwest. It'll be heavy and persistent, particularly for western Scotland, where there is a rain warning because of the saturated ground we currently have here. Temperatures up to 15 Celsius, not feeling very pleasant though with the cloud and those outbreaks of rain. However, once the rain does move through, it does turn drier for a time in the south and southeast, albeit with a lot of low clouds and hill fog. And then we've got further outbreaks of rain across many parts of the country, again, most persistent towards the west of Scotland overnight, but a mild night because of the southwesterly wind and the extensive cloud cover, some places no lower than 12 or 13 Celsius. Now, Thursday morning starts off with those grey leaden skies staying damp and gloomy in the south as well as the far northeast. In between, the cloud does break up for a time, so some sunshine coming through for Scotland, for northeast England, for example, and feeling considerably warmer. Temperatures up to 18 or 19 Celsius in the east before further rain comes along later. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Pointed after that forecast, we had the Daily Star front cover predicting a heat wave by this Friday. weekend. 20 degrees, we're going to need our factor 50, but apparently that's nonsense. Well, it was 17, 18 last weekend when I was in Glasgow, but with the wind blowing, you didn't feel yeah, it at all. It was chilly. freezing. Uh, here is our competition, the Great British Giveaway, uh, your chance to enter that. £10,000 in cash, a £10,000 holiday on a Greek cruise ship as well, and uh, could be worth you having a go. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 
Um, worms. Um, apparently, we've got to be very more caring to worms. Uh, a survey has shown that they are dying out. And, really? Uh, yeah, I don't know what you would do. I think by putting pesticides or fertiliser in your garden soil or whatever, it might be bad for them. Maybe the birds are eating too many of them, who knows? But anyway, there are not enough of them around. Hmm. How is it that there's not enough worms, but there seems to be loads of maggots, rats, cockroaches, flies in our hospitals? We've got it all wrong. It's all going wrong somewhere. Yes, yeah, somewhere. <laughs> um, should doctors start fining people who miss appointments? So if you make an appointment, don't turn up for it. Uh, you go to the dentist, you don't turn up for it, whatever. Um, what's your view on that? We've debated it. I think it, it makes next. sense, myself. What do you think? Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Children's stories like Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland now come with a trigger warning at universities. Universities alerting readers to possible themes of white supremacy. Yes, quote, these unquote. warnings are being applied to quo, what, colonial narratives. That's that's the claim commonly found in adventure stories and famous novels from the uh, Victorian era. Well, joining us now is the actor Charlie Lawson. And, and Charlie, um, these warnings have been applied to Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland. I, I, What's, what's this university getting at? Well, look, first of all, this is not um, this is nothing new. Um, uh, we hadn't heard about it for a while. Universities have been doing this over the last couple of years. I remember having a chat with one of your colleagues. But when Gabriella, the lovely Gabby, phoned me up today, I, I had to beg her to put me on after 9 o'clock because I, I found myself... <laughs> getting rather irate about the whole thing, but I will do my best to be very polite. Uh, yes, keep it clean. Said, yes, look, which is quite difficult for me, as you'll appreciate over this subject. Look, this is universities just jumping on the same, relative, you know, trying to be relative, relevant bandwagon. Uh, you know, is it any wonder that um, you, we look at the quality of um, graduates from university, and, and in my humble opinion, uh, some of them are slightly disappointing. But I did phone a couple of people I knew who had sons and daughters at various leading universities, and they had been speaking this morning. And thank the Lord, they think it's a complete load of bloody nonsense, as I do. Give the C.S. Lewis Centre a ring in East Belfast, because that's where your man came from. And I think you'll find you'll get short shrift because we're not all about that in East Belfast. We don't censor anything. Join me, Camilla Tominey, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight and the following morning, 5 till 6am on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. So here's what they're doing in France, right? If you book a doctor's appointment and then you don't turn up, you will be fined, right? And you'll be fined five euros. Poultry. Poultry? I think it's poultry, anyway. Mm. Um, so, anyway, with uh, many people already struggling across the country to get access to a doctor, we're asking if the NHS should do the same, either with a poultry fine or a bigger fine for those who miss appointments. All right, well, let's get the thoughts this morning of the online coach, Catherine Gladwin. She says, yes, we should be fined for missing GP appointments, but the founder of the Women's Forum, Divas of Colour, Fortsina Anyanwu, says missing appointments is a part of life and punishing people is cruel. How um, can you say it's a part of life when you've got professionals who are sitting, waiting, ready to go, a system that's strained and whatever, and then somebody doesn't bother their backside? No, um, 
Um, actually, I didn't say uh, it's part of life. What I said was um, there are underlining issues that could happen. And if we go the route of um, finding people, then women especially are going to be disproportionately you know, um, affected. Mm -hmm. Now, you think of um, a woman that has children, for example. Sometimes there might be sudden illness. There might be a woman with buggies and carrying her children and missing her bus. And sometimes when you're going to see the GP, if you get there by like even five minutes late, you will not be seen. So these are issues that NHS need to fix. We need to be looking at how to fix the broken system and make it easier for people to you know, to attend their ap appointments and make it easy. The, sometimes people receive the appointment even on the day of, of the appointment. There are no nudges, there are no um, contact prior to the date of the appointment. So there are a lot of things that we need to do or NHS need to do mm. to make it easier for those demographics who are, you know, who you know, find it difficult to attend their appointments yeah. to make well, it easier for them to come. There might be a few people, Fortsina, um, who find it difficult to attend their appointments, but, Catherine, there are also people who treat the NHS with disdain. They know it's free at the point of use. They were feeling ill when they made the appointment. They feel better when it comes to the appointment and they simply don't bother to tell anyone that they're not coming and they're quite happy to waste people's time. So, surely, five pounds for that indifference is a small price to pay that could go a long way to helping an ailing NHS system. Absolutely. Oh. And uh, I think it could be more than five pounds. But I think it, it, it doesn't need to happen on the first appointment. Maybe there's a two strike rule or a three strike rule or something like that. But it takes seconds to phone up. And I appreciate that some people may be in a situation, a car accident or something, and it means they, they can't attend. But there's nothing stopping you phoning afterwards and apologising and just taking that pressure off those receptionists and explaining why you were unable to make the appointment. But I, th I mean, my own GP has got an app and I can cancel my appointments on my app. It's So it's it, perhaps other GPs could adopt that to make it easier for those people that don't mm. like phoning. But I, I don't see the problem. Nobody's going to chastise you for phoning up and cancelling. Instead, they, they you should be in trouble for not attending. Not turning up. Yeah. yeah. Phoning up, you can do. Turning up, you, you can't do, for Stina. No, phoning up, um, for my own GP, for example, if you phone my GP, you're going to be online for more than one hour. That's a waste of a whole time. And, again, 11.7 million people are in poverty in the UK at the moment. 4.3 million children are in poverty at the moment. So when we pass a, path, a, a, a level, we forget the people behind. There, there might be a mother or a person who is so poor, they don't even have electricity at that time, at that day. They don't have a Wi-Fi or they don't have Not credit sure. on What's... their phone. Excuse me, let me finish. To call the GP. And when you call the GP, my own GP, you might call and nobody's going to answer you. It takes like a whole long time to get uh, to get through the, to, to the GP. So calling on that day doesn't even make any sense. So okay. I think there should be a way for them to send you an automated message where you can just, you know, um, say yes or no on that day to yeah, say so I'm Catherine, coming or I'm not coming. Should, should allowances be made for those who are living in extreme poverty who might not have electricity, for example? I'm not sure what the correlation is there with not having electricity and not being able to attend a doctor's appointment, though. I, I've missed the link. Sorry, I don't understand. The link would be, let's say, for example, a child has an appointment and there's no electricity or gas or whatever to get the child ready to go to the GP or to feed the baby at a time. The baby's crying, you can't control things. I'm a mother, I have four children. I've gone through a time when my children were toddlers. I know what it means. There are times when you want to get up and do things. They're not getting up. You're not You're not able to get them ready. The electricity issue, the, um, the um, what's it called, the, the stress of whatever that is going on at that time could affect your getting ready to get to where you're supposed to get to. And then sometimes some people will try and get there five minutes late and you will not be seen. You have to still go back. Some people don't have money to even take the transport, to get a bus to go where they're going to. There's no money in their, in their, in their, in their, in their oyster. So we need to think of the people at the bottom of the economy and not just, you know, 
OK. Yeah. Guys, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm afraid we've got to hang up on you guys. We're out of time. But uh, thank you both, uh, Catherine and Faustina. Appreciate it. Uh, just a thought that's come in from one of our um, people using our Your Say system. And they've made the point, Andy Graham, if you miss an NHS dentist appointment, you're struck off their list. And there you go. And other people saying the fine should be £50. Let us know your thoughts. GB News. Dot com forward slash uh, the cast report leading our news today. We've got diversity activist Katie John Went, uh, who was on the programme earlier. We've got your questions, your queries, your points uh, to put to her on child gender after this. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. In Cumbria, the A686 is closed at Langwathby to the northeast of Penrith because of a shed load of offal. The M621 in West Yorkshire is partly blocked eastbound by an accident between junctions 5 and 6 near Leeds, causing delays. In Conway, the A548 is closed each way because of flooding between Pentra Isaf and Llanfair Talhen. In Nottinghamshire, the A614 is closed at Farnsfield after an accident. In Deep West Midlands, the A38 is closed westbound along Bristol Road at Edgbaston in Birmingham after an accident. In Essex, on the A12, 12, as a lane closed southbound where a car's broken down in deep roadworks between junctions 26 and 25 near Colchester causing delays and on the M27 in Hampshire there's a lane closed westbound for repairs after an accident overnight between junctions 12 and 11 from Portsmouth to Fareham causing queues and that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. At six o'clock this morning, we had the privilege of talking to Katie John Went about our top story, which is the National Health Service reviewing gender care. There's Katie John there. Katie John, I have to say, you were popular, very, very popular when you were talking today. A lot of people thought um, you spoke common sense. You talked about your own journey uh, with all of this and whatever. Um, and so I'm going to go straight to the, the questions that are, that are coming in. Maggie says, my daughter is a lesbian but she loved boys' toys and clothes when she was a child. This doesn't mean that she was trans and we never suggested it. Maybe some kids just need more pushback, more understanding as to who or what they will see themselves as. So their daughter was lesbian, not transgender. What do you think about uh, the, the prescription of such? Can it happen a bit too soon? I love boys, toys and clothes when I was a kid too. Um, so I didn't fulfil any stereotypes around what does a trans person, woman look like either in terms of their childhood. 
Pushback? Is pushback the right word? I don't know. I think it's allowing play without assuming that play suddenly makes you another gender. Mm. I think that it's part of it is, is sex stereotypes, toy stereotypes, clothing stereotypes, allowing people greater freedom without that freedom to be suddenly a confirmation bias of, of who you actually are meant to be or anything like that. And the very fact that we do know that around 75 to 80 percent of of teens, are kind of, um, young people and teens um, experiencing gender distress, dysphoria, confusion, uh, whatever it might be, actually go on to actually find out that they are just yeah. um, um, lesbian or gay or bisexual, yeah. or indeed someone who is just bucking bucking oh. the sex stereotypes around being a tomboy, but not even being lesbian. Katie John, tell me to shut up um, at, at any stage, but um, you, you are so open about things. Could I talk to you about um, gender preference or sexuality in terms of partners? Right. So you, you were born male, you became female. Does that then change who you're attracted to or does, doesn't that matter? Is that part of the equation? In other words, what I'm saying is, would you be automatically attracted to a male now or a female? Oh, just t t t explain to me or tell me to shut up. No, 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 absolutely. I, I, I openly answer all questions to my own detriment, perhaps. <laughs> so, but the point is, um, yeah, I have always been attracted to women, but I questioned whether I was attracted to men. Uh, my first experience of sexuality was with a guy at school, age 15. Uh, my next was with uh, a woman in my university years who I ended up marrying. She was a psychiatrist. They'd married 15 years. Um, subsequently from that, I came out of that marriage and I thought, well, so hold on, what is my sexuality? I'm exploring gender, but I'm also not entirely sure of my sexuality. I would have been so relieved to have found out that I was simply gay in that male-male sense. It would have involved no surgery, no hormones, no, yeah. no bun fight around being trans that we currently have. But nonetheless, I, so I, I explored men and women briefly um, and, and realized that I still preferred women but also found that I was generally not particularly interested in sex at all. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that also does happen is that what little libido I already had um, disappeared almost completely with the taking of hormones. Um, but we do know that there is some evidence that actually the taking of hormones can either trigger or shift sexuality to a degree or bring out a latent sexuality. So there are people, and it is very common knowledge, um, in, certainly amongst hearsay and people working in it 10 years ago were telling me that they found out that within six months of surgery, um, people were changing their sexuality mm. and shifting it. Whether that was latent and hidden or whether the hormones affected it, we don't know. Can yeah. I ask you about that bun fight you're talking about there? We've had some questions about that, and it was picked up on in this CAS report where uh, Dr Hillary uh, identified what she called exceptional toxicity in this stormy discourse that really hasn't helped young people navigate this minefield. Well, Danny's got in touch saying, my grandson is non-binary. I'm not sure what that means, but my daughter says I now have to call him they. This confuses me every time I see him, and I've ended up not going over to see them so much as a result. Now, that's a tragedy, isn't it? If the whole topic has become such a taboo that relationships are breaking down within immediate families. Uh, yeah, and actually, I, I kind of like the terminology of non-binary. Um, I often get introduced as a trans woman. I actually often say to producers or whoever, or at a, or a talk or a panel show, please introduce me as a trans person. I prefer person, human being, over the gendered language of man or woman. I've certainly navigated both surgically and legally and hormonally, but there are people on either side who will, will never, that will never be enough. And I'm okay with that. So call me a trans person. I don't, I'm not taking offense by that. So non-binary also fits for me to a degree as well. It describes someone who's got a foot in both camps and who has transitioned on that journey. And if someone asks me my pronouns, I tend to say they, she, he, in that yeah. order. If you're going to keep persistently calling me he, I get why you might be doing it. They seems to fit, but I also get that it's hard to attach yourself to. My nephew from about the age of eight or nine was happily using they for me, but the rest of my family would never um, would never accept it. And I completely understand that yeah. as well, but it is very easy just to use someone's name and avoid pronouns altogether. Okay. Well, well, that gets us into the, the whole subject of culture. Aaron says um, th this is a problem within Britain because uh, British culture has been under attack for a few decades now. Uh, he says children are being brought up with no culture so they create their own.
That's what's yeah. happening at the minute with this thing. I mean, it's a bit, a bit simplistic, but has it got any part in what we're talking about? It's half true. Children create their own, not because they're being brought up with no culture. We shouldn't be kind of indoctrinating any culture on kids. We should be giving them the world to play in, so to speak, and expanding their minds rather than narrowing them. But we also shouldn't kind of be replacing them with another narrow mindset. Um, there's a distinct lack of the freedom to play, as I say, without this kind of confirmation that, right. that play is now a thing. So within that, children, I found that there's also, a firm, when I've worked with youth, I found that they have been rejecting to a degree Agree, the LGBT language even of 20 years ago to say that we now have a far broader landscape and a far broader yeah. language. Um, so they are creating their own vocabulary there, even if they are bisexual or lesbian and gay or trans themselves, gotcha, they gotcha. have okay. greater variety. Fin final point, um, Katie John, and they, um, uh, honestly, uh, so many people wanting to talk to you today. Johnny's saying, when I was young, there was no one he said there was no one who was transgender. Why is it suddenly everywhere? Is it genuine or is it just a way of seeking attention? I don't think it's attention seeking. If anything, you get unwanted attention. It's not easy being trans. The idea that people navigate to being trans to avoid being lesbian or gay, for example, because it's harder to be lesbian or gay, it's in most cases easier to be lesbian and gay than trans. I do think there is elements of social contagion, but I think it's 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 not to get attention but there is this the social element that being different is 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 supported and endorsed but there are many ways to be different the ultimate thing is to be yourself but it's a long journey mm. finding that and the gender pathway may be one way to finding yourself not finding yourself as a differently gendered person but just finding yourself in other words exploring and finding not the identity that fits but how do you fit into this world as an individual as a personality as a human being with needs and wants and desires and not have the world shape you let alone I ideology well, or social media or anything, look, but to just be happy. Yeah. We, we are delighted we have found you, our trans person, um, today. Uh, thank you. For, it's been an absolute delight yeah. uh, talking to you. And uh, Katie John, I have to say this because she just doesn't look at... I mean, it's 57 years of age. And, um, and, and what a life you have led. And thank you for talking to us about it so openly today. Yeah. I think it's done a lot of good. If thank you. If only we could all talk so rationally and so yeah. calmly about this topic. Appreciate your That's time. That's what's needed. Yeah. OK. Bye-bye. Bye all bye. the best. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Um, stay with us. Lots more discussion points of all the big stories of the day. We've got Norman Baker and Oscar Redrop for one last romp through the papers. See you in a sec. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Offline and overlooked. That's what Age UK say millions of British pensioners are. Why? Because they cannot or won't access the internet. It's leading to digital exclusion. So the charities campaigning for public services like banks, utilities and even the NHS to maintain a more human approach. Everything's online. People assume you've got a smartphone with a, with a mobile number and uh, an email and without that you don't exist in this world anymore. We've got to try and get the government to see that it's so important to make people feel that they belong because there's a, there's a feeling that the older generation just feel that they're forgotten, they're in the way and we already know that anyway, but it's just another reason for them to feel that they're not wanted. They'll just accept it and they'll say, well, that's it, I can't do it anymore. And that's it, whereas other people would be really kicking and screaming. So we need to be the voice for older people. Despite digital technology playing an increasing role in our lives, around one in five over 65s in the UK don't use the internet. 
Thornycroft Centre in Pontefract, West Yorkshire, provides a space for this age group to socialise and get help to go online. I'm not that good with mobiles, so when you mention anything about online, I ain't a clue what you're talking about. The closure of thousands of banks is also detrimental to the older generation. A lot of our members what come, they tend to use cash. Um, they don't like to use bank cards. I think a lot of it's trust or the lack of knowledge. They don't understand how it works. I think they're very vulnerable as well with online. It's really important that they're aware how to use it and how to use it safely. So in an online era, it's still crucial for many to have an offline option. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Everybody talking today with Norman Baker and Oscar Reddrop. Happy to see you both back again today. Now, uh, Norman, um, the Rwandan president, Paul Kagame, uh, is a giant. He's, he's huge, or he seems it, because uh, he, he's pictured with Rishi, Rishi Sunak outside number 10, and Rishi <laughs> Sunak is, is, is diminutive, it has to be said, at, at least. There's a big difference between the two of them. Um, so what was he here talking about yesterday? What well, I, I suppose a PM to defend him can't help his stature, but it doesn't um, help him in international agreements when he's dealing with people who are much larger than him. Yes. It's an old-fashioned thing. Um, I mean, the, the difference also is that the uh, president of Rwanda is very keen on the European Convention of Human Rights and says if Britain leaves the convention, uh, then uh, the deal's off which is important when people are talking about leaving the ECHR. However, the story here... I'm laughing at this picture. Sunak's on a step. He's yes. even still smaller than this guy. He is, he is. Guy. Actually, sorry, just on the height of, of um, Rishi Sunak, he's mm. about the same height as Boris Johnson and of Emmanuel Macron, but is somehow right? he not. looks smaller. I promise you he it's, is. Well, seen he, Boris Johnson's five foot six. They're all about the same height. They've but stood Boris next Johnson's to each other. Boris Johnson's not five foot six. That's I, I think Boris's charisma... It's just, uh, it's just a bit wider, dare I say. <laughs> He's a bit wider. And also, if you see Rishi Sunak next to David Cameron, you think, who's the Prime Minister here? I know. Uh, yeah, we talked right. about that earlier, didn't we? Yeah. The but anyway, the story, the story in the Metro... Is it the Metro? Yeah, the story in the Metro is that the, uh, these homes, which have been set aside in Rwanda for people coming from Britain, because nothing's happening, 70% of them have been sold. Gosh. Um, so there's nowhere for them to go anyway. So even if we do get to send people to Rwanda, there's nowhere for them to stay? No, there was only 163 of them. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's hardly anything compared to the numbers. Mm. We're talking about. It's I mean, tarrant, it's, Norman. it's neither here nor um, there, is it? Uh, there's another angle on this story mm. today uh, in one of the papers. I can't remember which one. That apparently the state airline, Rwandan-owned yes. state That's airline, right. doesn't want to be involved in the scheme because of branding issues. And this yeah. is supposed to be loved by Kagame and his government. So is it or not? You know, the state on board or not? I, well, British I, Airways, you could understand <laughs> if they didn't want to be involved, but this is the state-run airline. The, 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 the UK government can't find an airline. The whole thing is so toxic, they can't find an airline to, to take people across to Rwanda, think, even I, the flights mm, take off. I think there's probably a little bit of mischief-making, admittedly in the vacuum that's been left by not being able to get this over the line. There are certain parts of the Tory party, particularly on the right, of the, on, on the right of the party, that would say the stories that we're seeing at the moment are as a result of inaction and actually, if they could go to their constituents and get one flight out there, they genuinely believe, these MPs, that their, um, their fate at the next general election would be helped hugely. Uh, but it's and not will happening. It happen? I think they're wrong if they think that, by the way. People, people worry about the economy and the NHS predominantly. So now we're going to talk about, Oscar, a, a lady called Caroline, Carol Wynne. And Carol Wynne had got a gas meter um, installed in her house. That's the good news. The bad news is what? <laughs> sorry, I, 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 we can work out if this... Um, the, it was, it's not supposed to be funny. No, it's not. It's, it's not. Sorry. Funny, but Slap it is out funny of it. It's so silly. It's, it's silly. What it's, to say, yeah. So she got her smart meter installed and it ended up being installed nine feet off the ground. So uh, how does she read it? She, she can't read it unless she uses a quite a large stepladder. And uh, on top of all of this, 
that smart, the smart leader actually broke, so she needs to take the meter readings herself and report back to British Gas. Um, the picture is, you know, slightly amusing in, in the paper if you can pick up the mail today. But the serious point, and also, sorry, on top of this, it's actually, outra it's actually outrageous, this. Not only that, but the engineer engineers then locked her gas meter box and didn't leave her a key. Um, so... Helpful. Very... I couldn't think of anything... Going and then she'll be prosecuted for not producing a metre reading. Absolutely. 200 quid a pop mm. as well. Um, let's look at the TV adverts, uh, Norman. Um, so he here we've got a, a crisp advert, uh, <laughs> certainly for on show in Italy. Why is it caused controversy? Uh, well, crisp in more ways than one, I think, actually, because this is a television advert uh, in which Italian nuns are offered crisps rather than communion wafers. <laughs> and this is this has been uh, not deemed to be sorry no, it's no, no that's the body of sorry. Christ yeah I will indeed and that, that's the point made by the uh, Italian bishops uh, conferences Christ reduced to a crisp uh, debased and vilified as he was two thousand years ago it says um, so they've taken uh, rather badly and I can understand why I mean to trivialise these things in, the, in mm. a crisp advert is it's hardly just having appropriate. a sense of humour though isn't it yeah. well they're, they're calling it blasphemous. That's the thing. Uh, however, I mean, I find it quite amusing, but um, uh, and I speak as a Catholic. Uh, however, um, if this was a Jewish uh, slight or if this was Muslim, whatever, um, it would, there would be prison mm. sentences being mm. handled Let's out, not I would forget, have thought. You can't mm. be a prime minister and a Catholic still in this country. Well, you can't be, you can't be a monarch and a, and a, and a, and a Catholic. Yeah. That's, that's been outlawed since 1702 or thereabouts, I think it is, mm -hmm. or something. 1688, was it? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I went to um, the, the... I forgot what the word is, the inauguration of King Charles at uh, St James's Palace, and he had to read out this guff about how Catholics must be kept away from, from the, wow. the monarchy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's extraordinary, actually, to hear it. Yeah. It's well, hundreds of years old. There we go. Musicians and actors under threat from AI, Oscar. Tell us more. Um, yeah, the uh, select um, committee of MPs were told by lots of high-profile musicians, including Nile Rogers, that AI technology is devaluing the industry. It is crazy. You can use AI to rip off someone's exact tone and voice. So, you know, Eamon, you could say, you know, can Elvis Presley sing, you know, a song by yeah. Eminem? And he would do it in, you know, a yeah. matter of seconds. Uh, serious point to make is it is terribly sad. There is nothing more moving, there is nothing more stirring mm. than music. We hold it so dear to us. And the fact that it can just, in an instant, you know, with AI, uh, kind of dilute yeah. and in the passing of time... Be written without feeling. It, without exactly. Message, without, yeah. Exactly. Um, I, I, I think it's an incredible danger. I mean, I'm really worried about AI, but um, I was telling Isabel yesterday, I was interviewed by, a, uh, by, by people who were not from this country, um, for a magazine article, and obviously my interview was fed into an AI <laughs> translation machine. Honestly, guys, you could not make it up. You really could not make it up what came out the other yeah. end. Nothing making sense, and they thought this was all OK. Mm. But, um, so... You sure it was a translation rather than you, Oh, it was definitely... I, that, it was definitely a <laughs> translation. Um, definitely I've got an update translation. on the heights. Cooper, our producers, just sent me Ooh. through. So, Rishi Sunak's five foot seven. Macron, also five foot seven. Vladimir Putin... Also, five foot seven. Mm. Wow. So there you go, a lot of short men in power. What wow. does that say? It's the, it's the, the, the tie. It's, a, it's, a it's act the Rishi's short trousers. It's the <laughs> short trousers and the oh, skinny tie. You were just so updating me on, on Trainergate, because he's been talking on the airwaves this morning <laughs> yeah, about Yeah, he, he's apologised for I am wearing, wearing the same trainers as him today, yeah. actually. Do you accept his apology? Dad. I don't accept his apology. <laughs> no, of course I do. I, I don't care what yeah, trainers he yeah, wears yeah. myself. Um, <laughs> for, for, for Vladimir Putin, it's his act of compensatory factor. Being small, you have to have big weapons to make up for that. Well, yeah, there's a lot of that, isn't yeah. there? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, what about worms? Are you worried, Oscar, about worms at all in the back garden? You've got 30 <laughs> seconds. In the back garden. Um, uh, funnily enough, I was at someone's house and they were doing uh, a bit of gardening and, you know, you take out the soil and you put it away and you put it, like, you know, neatly over the winter. And uh, what? There, there were the biggest worms I've ever seen really? in my life. Ooh. Yeah, genuinely. Wow. They were kind of mm, huge. huge. They've just been growing over the winter. Well, that's good. Good luck to them. Apparently, we Bile. need more of them. Mm. Uh, Norman and Oscar, thank you both very much pleasure. indeed. Very entertaining and informative today. We'll leave it there. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Much, thank indeed. you. And here's Aidan McGiven with the weather. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News.
Hello, a very good morning to you. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office. It's a bright start for many of us, but it will turn increasingly cloudy this morning with more rain to come, especially across western and northwestern parts. That's where the rain is already arriving through the morning. We keep the sunshine in the east at least until lunchtime, but, well, it does get squeezed out by thickening cloud and a freshening breeze along with those outbreaks of rain. The rain will be on and off and mostly light in the south towards the northwest. It'll be heavy and persistent, particularly for western Scotland, where there is a rain warning because of the saturated ground we currently have here. Temperatures up to 15 Celsius, not feeling very pleasant though with the cloud and those outbreaks of rain. However, once the rain does move through, it does turn drier for a time in the south and southeast, albeit with a lot of low clouds, some hill fog. And then we've got further outbreaks of rain across many parts of the country, again, most persistent towards the west of Scotland overnight, but a mild night because of the southwesterly wind and the extensive cloud cover, some places no lower than 12 or 13 Celsius. Now, Thursday morning starts off with those grey leaden skies staying damp and gloomy in the south as well as the far northeast. In between, the cloud does break up for a time, so some sunshine coming through for Scotland, for northeast England, for example, and feeling considerably warmer. Temperatures up to 18 or 19 Celsius in the east before further rain comes along later. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News Travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. On the M6 in Warwickshire, the inside lanes closed southbound just before Junction 3, the Coventry and Uneaton turn after an accident causing delays. In the West Midlands, the A38s closed westbound along Bristol Road at Edgbaston in Birmingham after an accident with queues towards there. On the M25 in Essex, the outside lanes closed clockwise with an accident in junctions 27 and 28 from the M11 to the A12, causing roughly two miles of queues. And then from Essex into Kent, it's down to two out of four lanes where there's an accident on the QE2 bridge with queues from junction 30 for the A13. On the M4 in Gloucestershire, the inside lanes closed westbound just after Junction 18 at Bath after an accident causing queues. And on the M27 in Hampshire, there's a lane closed westbound for repairs after an accident overnight between Junctions 12 and 11 from Portsmouth to Therham, taking roughly 40 minutes in the queues. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel trips for another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good morning, fast approaching 9 o'clock. It's Wednesday, the 10th of April. Uh, very nice to have you on board. This is Breakfast in GB News. Eamon Holmes and Isabel Webster. 
A landmark review into gender care has revealed thousands of children have been let down by the NHS through a shocking lack of research on treatments given to those questioning their gender. Earlier, we spoke to the government on the issue. There is nothing comparable in any other country that is remotely as in-depth as this. And we did it because we were worried about what was happening and we were worried about the way that certain NHS procedures were happening. Conservative backlash against the latest ECR ruling, which means individuals can sue for a breach of human rights if Britain fails to meet net zero targets. Earlier, we spoke to the Shadow Home Secretary, Beck Cooper, about what she thinks on the ECHR. The Tories will always do this. They always would look for something else to blame and something else to distract from their chaos. And, you know, it's not the ECHR that means we've got a crisis in our NHS or that we've got real problems with energy bills shooting through the roof. And Princess Catherine has been named the most popular royal. We'll be looking at that in just a moment. It might be a bright start out there for some of us, but more rain is on the way. However, it will also turn a bit warmer over the next couple of days. Full details with me in the forecast coming up. So it's our top story this morning and we've had lots of reaction from you throughout the course of the programme about this. The National Health Service has been ordered to review gender care for children following a landmark and damning report. This is the CAS review and it found no evidence that the use of blockers which delay puberty led to better mental health outcomes. Well, let's speak to our new news reporter, Ray Addison, who joins us in the studio. Uh, good morning to you, Ray. Um, Hilary Cass um, is being sort of widely praised, I think, for taking a lot of the heat out of this debate and saying what a lot of us have all been saying for a long time, that ultimately this is about children. But what are the key findings of this report and how much of a turning point do you think this might be? Well, I think it's going to be a significant turning point, although we should caveat that by saying that NHS England does not appear to have committed to um, implementing all of the recommendations. They say they're going to review the recommendations and then implement them. Um, but it doesn't indicate they're going to implement all of them, although there has been a number of changes in recent years. 32 recommendations in all. Um, Top of the list, probably extreme caution, uh, Dr Hilary Cass says, before prescribing hormones for children. She says there needs to be a clear clinical rationale before any masculinising or feminising hormones are issued to under-18s. And there should also be a separate pathway for anyone who's trying to uh, take this kind of treatment who is yet to hit puberty. And that's obviously been a really serious concern for um, a lot of people who've used the service, but also members of the public, that children are just uh, going down a pathway which which they then cannot go back from. Clinical advice for parents as well, and uh, re full research into the outcomes of those who receive this kind of treatment. Yeah, interesting to hear her say the field of medicine that this is built on has shaky foundations, really saying that this is a generation of children that have been guinea pigs. Do you mm -hmm. think that we could see a situation where youngsters turn around and say, actually, I'm going to take legal action against the NHS because I've been experimented on here? We've already seen some legal action. Uh, Kira Bell... Uh, has brought some, uh, has, has gone to the courts. There's some more legal action um, just starting as well against the use of private clinics. And I think more and more young people who've gone through this process and are now into adulthood um, are rethinking their options and obviously look, looking back at this. You say sort of shaky foundations. One of the things that I think was really interesting from this report, um, Dr Hillary saying that six of seven adult NHS gender clinics refused to cooperate in this study. Um, she said that was hugely disappointing, mm -hmm. frustrating on behalf uh, of the young people and their families because there was an opportunity here to reduce the uncertainties about what happens to these young people when they become adults and what their life is like after they've mm. transitioned. Um, and I suppose that speaks to the toxicity in this whole debate and she says that that has really not helped these children that are navigating a minefield. She called it the, the stormy discourse around all of this and about activists in particular making it impossible to say things without causing offence. Absolutely. I think, you know, it's, it's one of those areas that can become very heated very quickly. Um, we do know that some people are kind of ideologically attached to this as an issue rather than taking a purely clinical approach. This has been one of the, one of the concerns uh, from Dr Hillary. Um, and and w one of the things that she's recommending as well, which I think is key, is that the NHS should introduce a detransitioning service. So she wants to shake up and reform 
so you know the gender services which could include transitioning mm. but what about those who want to detransition there needs to be adequate resources for them too okay ray addison thanks very much indeed the Princess of Wales is now officially the most popular royal. This is a YouGov poll that found that over 75% of people have a positive view of Princess Catherine, with Prince William only slightly behind his wife at 73%. Uh, Cameron Walker, a royal correspondent, is here. Uh, with this one, well, what would you what would you read into that, and as to why? Well, I think it's hardly surprising. Since the start of the year, the Princess of Wales's popularity is up six points with the British public, according to this YouGov poll. And obviously, at the start of the year, she went into hospital for abdominal surgery and has subsequently been diagnosed with cancer and is undergoing surgery. Look, the Princess of Wales, since becoming a, a member of the royal family, has committed no major faux pas. There's been no particular scandal with yeah. her. She always puts family first, uh, and she really champions uh, uh, causes such as mental health, importance of the provision for early years as well. And I hate the phrase born a commoner, but oh. she wasn't born into aristocracy. Uh, she was not born into the royal family. She gave up her old, old life. And yes, that comes with lots of privilege, being a member of the royal family. But it also comes with enormous challenges, such as everybody prying into your private life, particularly when it comes to your health. And I think the British public are very much on side with that. Well, it could be worse. Uh, we look at her figures. So 76% say they have a positive view of the Princess of Wales, um, whereas Prince Harry and Meghan... <coughs> continue to be unpopular, 76 compared to 31% having a positive opinion of uh, Prince Harry, and only 26%, 50 points less, than Princess Catherine is Meghan. Yes, still not looking great for Harry and Meghan. Prince Andrew is even below, is far below them as well. But when you look at the um, figures around the young people in particular, under 25s, Harry and Meghan are polling more favourably with young people amongst mm -hmm. the British public. But that's not to say they are well well liked by young people. Uh, the uh, the net the, the net favourability scores still put them below zero amongst young people. So they do have some way to go if they're going to increase their popularity with the British public. Prince Harry expected to come over to the UK in May for the Invictus <coughs> Games service. St Paul's Cathedral. We still don't know if Meghan is going to accompany him. Mm -hmm. um, doing well on uh, negative views, meaning fewer people have negative views about her than anyone else, is the Princess Royal, Princess Anne. Indeed, yes. The most hard-working royal, if you go by the number of engagements she carries out each year. No nonsense, no fuss. She never gets herself into any kind of uh, arguments or scandals. She, she's she been the member of the royal family who has done a couple of media interviews recently, whereas others have been reluctant to do so. And I think perhaps if, if you're going to um, have a test of members of the royal family who can conduct a media interview in a, a correct way, it would be Princess Anne rather than her brother, Prince Andrew, who clearly uh, has made headlines this week with the um, publication of Scoop. Well, he's, yeah. he's, he's the mm. least popular royal of all. Yes. Um, really, a mere 6% of people having a positive view. He'll hate view. that, won't he? He will hate that. And that has been unchanged since that infamous Newsnight interview yeah. of Emily Maitlis in 2019. And I just don't see a way back from those negative no. popularity at the moment. Um, I won't ask you about Princess Catherine's health. We want to give her the space she needs. And I will just say that, of course, we are all really missing her. Seeing those pictures when you started talking really reminds me how much uh, we miss her from our screens. But we can ask you about uh, the King's health. And there are some positive signs, aren't there? Certainly the mood music seems to be that he might be back uh, in public soon. Yeah, there certainly are. If we saw him on Easter Sunday, of course, uh, he was greeting members of the public. Royal sources told me at the time that this should be taken as a view that doctors are very are very positive about the King's health and it is very much going in the right direction, his cancer treatment. They are not ruling out the trip to Australia that's been widely reported in the autumn. Uh, and as you say, that it looks like he's going to be starting to ramp up engagements as we get towards the summer. But of course, the caveat to all of that is how he responds to cancer treatments mm. and at the moment it remains unclear. Yeah, well, we wish them both very well, of course, goes without saying. Cameron, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much Thanks. indeed. And, and, and also I think it's important to point out that uh, the way people vote and how they think of the royals differs by generational... Gap, yeah, it? it certainly does. I think younger people have perhaps a slightly more negative view of the monarchy. Older yes. people have a slightly more positive view of the monarchy. Okay. Thank you, Cameron. All right, Britain's newsroom coming up at half past nine. Andrew and Bev are in the studio. What's coming up? Morning. Good morning. Looking Good morning. Oh, we've colour coordinated as well. It's happening. Not intentional. <laughs> we don't speak. <laughs> I don't believe you. Um, we're going to be talking about the fact that Labour think they can save the high street. 
what could they possibly do? Switch off the internet. Switch off the internet. Because how else do you save the high street? Mm. How else can you save it? <laughs> yeah. We have all migrated to Amazon and all well, the other stuff. Well, they're going to tax uh, online more heavily. As Are they? they? Cut business rates. Are that they? Was their argument. Are they? We'll are see. they though? Are they though? But also on that as well, the Tories are saying that they will bring in a specific offence for the first time against people who shoplift mm. and attack shopkeepers. Remember in the pandemic that we all clapped the NHS workers, but shop workers worked throughout it yeah. too. Yes, yeah. but Andrew, the only thing I'm going to say, they can bring in whatever specific charges they want yeah. or whatever. They've no police officers to arrest them. Well, yeah, and exactly. No police officers to process and no, them. No and no space in the prisons <laughs> yeah. to put them. Yeah. Oh, well. So, I mean, it's all talk. I mean, this is just a headline grabbing. Yeah. Yeah. And, so I'm a bit um, cynical about that. But of course, the solution to all this is going to be facial ID, facial recognition ID on our streets, which I, of course, am not a big fan of. And we're going to be talking to Silky Carlo from Big Brother Watch, Watch about that because all the crooks are going to wear masks anyway. Yeah. So they're not going to care. They've got a hood up, they've got a mask. Your facial recognition mm. ID is going to do absolutely nothing uh, to stop crime. We're also going to do it on the European Court of Human Rights. Meddling and interfering. Here we go again, this time telling Switzerland it's against people's human rights if they don't have strong enough climate change laws. How, who are these judges to decide? It's for Apparently a matter there for was politicians. one British judge on the panel, the only judge to object to right. the ruling. Um, interesting, we spoke to Yvette Cooper um, this morning, mm. Shadow Home Secretary. Yeah. She links the ECHR in with everything in Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement. Mm. So is it just a headline for Rishi Sunak, for Suella Braverman, who's coming out and saying, and Robert Jenrick and I think also Claire Coutinho, all saying this is under democratic but it is leave the ECHR. but what would it mean for northern ireland we'll see i what well, my argument is you just if the ECHR, the easiest thing is if the ECHR does something you don't like just say thanks very much we're not doing it because that's what france does all the time all oh, right well there we go problem solved yeah <laughs> But we, yeah, but we're going to be having, we're going to be debating that basically. We've got a couple of people, and also in terms because it was obviously about the climate issue as well. So. Um, anything on um, the gender identity report? Yes, that of oh yeah, today. Stuff. I mean, yeah, big massive. debate on that. Real, yeah. I mean, your paper's gone big on it. Andrew. Yeah, I mean, it's basically saying the CAS report pretty much says don't even start this till you're about yeah. 25 mm. because of the. the, the the brain is still maturing. Mm. I think it probably matures a lot after that, yeah. too. Well, I, what I think is interesting about this report is all the politicians are coming out saying, absolutely, we accept all of this unreservedly. Well, hang on a minute. Have the government actually failed to deal with this sooner? Because these, this whole yeah. generation of kids have been treated like guinea pigs, to be no. honest. They've sat yeah. on the fence over it, I'm afraid. And also, it won't mean anything if private health care still offers... Oh, well, it yeah, and that's it is. a big problem. And, and it, it is. is. So, what so if you can afford it, you can still yeah. go and get your... You'd, Thank you'd, you, guys. We've pills. got the biggest private health care package going here, the Great British Giveaway. <laughs> £10,000 cash, luxury travel items, £10,000 Greek cruise for next year. Here's how you could win it. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then, we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel Treats. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. It would be nice, wouldn't it, on this Wednesday? Don't you just fancy a little trip to Greece? With lovely weather, lovely yeah. weather. Oh, no fires. Of course, last year there were fires. There were all those fires oh, yeah. and things in Greece. And um, that's what we're going to talk about next. We're going to talk about climate change. And um, our um, meteorologist, uh, Jim Dale, he's coming to the studio and he's got a book um, and, and he's named certain chapters after mm. songs like Bridge Over Troubled Water and mm. whatever like that um, because it's not good yeah. in the weather. And I will just add, he always gets you <laughs> under the collar, does Jim Dale. So I'll be keeping my eye on uh, your views whilst we have him in the studio and I'll put as many of those questions to him as I can while he's done here. 
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. Men's mental health, yeah. men are starting to talk a lot more. Yeah. You've been through a lot of stuff that uh, people don't know about. Yeah, I mean, um, the last few years for me have been very, very difficult. Um, people, don't, people see me on tour, performing, making music, um, but um, myself and my wife, um, you know, we went through... Um, two miscarriages, oh, um, wow. you know, and, you know, for us, that was a very devastating mm. course. time and very difficult to, to, to know how to kind of process those emotions. Mm. And I guess as a man, I, I did the thing of bottling up my emotions and where I feel comfortable to, to be able to express myself is in the studio, whereas, you know, she had obviously a different reaction to, you know, what happened to us because not only was it happening to her mentally, psychologically, but it was happening to her physically as well. And I think what something that she really would wanted to see from me was that sensitivity and that emotion. And I thought that as a man being strong was trying to bottle up my emotions and just show her that, no, mm. you know, that I'm, I'm being strong for her. Mm. But actually being strong was is talking about it. Mm. And what's happened ever since I've started to talk about it is I've spoken to more men that have experienced baby loss. My wife forced out of me, you know, how do you feel? And I ended up as a mess on the floor. I was exasperating, crying, mm -hmm. almost inconsolable. She was just holding me in her arms um, as we cried together, and we cried together. Um, and I didn't realise I needed that release so badly. Like I said, I've been able to speak to other men, and, and, and we've been able to cry together, and they've, they shared their own experiences, which they did similar to me. But actually, you know, as men, I feel like that conversation and that sensitivity and being able to be mm -hmm. emotional together 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Well, we've experienced it so far this week, extreme weather again, mm. uh, particularly in West Sussex, uh, oh, becoming an all-too-common phenomenal storm Kathleen. Oh, yeah. Wreaking travel chaos and flooding. And it was the 11th storm to be named this season. So who better to speak to about how we can survive increasingly extreme weather than Jim Dale, who's written a book about surviving extreme weather. Um, thank you very much for coming in. You're welcome. Um, and this is an entertaining book where you sort of give real-life examples 
of what to do in these crises like the people in Sussex just experienced yesterday. Yeah, it's it's not just about survival, it's it's also about the safety aspect. I mean safety comes before before survival, if that makes sense. But but yeah, um and it goes it's co-written by the way. So I, I I'm a co-author with Michael Hawke, who's who's a US uh, uh, special forces, ex special forces. The book is out in America at the moment. It's not out in the UK until the end of this month, uh, around about the 25th, 26th. Um, but yeah, go, go through all aspects of, of climate, weather, and associated. So even things like insect invasions and all that. I mean, he's the expert in mm. terms of how you do these things. And I, I've got some good knowledge, but I wrote the meteorology, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I wrote how these things occur, why they I occur. I almost think that um, if I'm going to be caught in anything, there are two things that scare me. Um, earthquakes, so I'm, I'm sort of loath to go to Japan and uh, the western coast of America uh, because of earthquakes. And uh, the other thing is fires, forest fires. Wildfires. Um, I yeah. tend to go to Portugal quite a lot, and uh, there is a lot of forest around there. So if you're caught in a wildfire... Mm. What do you do? Uh, what would you do? Um, well, first of all, you don't, you wouldn't be caught because the first thing to say is try to avoid the areas that are prone. So you've just said it for yourself. Mm. Now, I'm not saying people should not travel because I, I'm scared of earthquakes and therefore I'm never going to go to Los Angeles ever. Because let's face it, 364 days in the year, you're going to be fine. There's going to be no problem. It's the one day. This is this book is about the one day, one day. or the one hour where yeah. you're actually caught in these things. So. Uh, knowing knowing what your risks are is the first thing. Being prepared for that risk. So let's just say, for example, you took this book with you. You you know you go, you go on holiday and you think, right, I'm in a wildfire zone. What do I need to do? Well, you don't need to read the entire book. You read the chapter on the wildfire. What might you do? And when you see a wildfire, there's, there's a few things to think about. The fuel, what makes that happen in the first place? So combustion, uh, the leaves, the trees, is it a dry zone? Am I, am I at risk there? And then the wind. So you've got to know, and this sounds a, a little bit like, like you've got to be the meteorologist, but it's a bit like, which way is the wind blowing? Because, it, because you can run you can run in the wrong direction, if that makes sense, quite easily. Yeah. If you're going to escape, we've seen cars going through wildfires. You know, be almost being chased by the. But does by it the, sound? Is it the logical thing to do to head to the sea? Uh, in most cases, if the sea is very close, then the answer is yes, because mm. the sea will not burn. So it, I think that happened in in Greece a couple of years ago, didn't it? Where where they jumped? You know, they, there was no other escape but jump into the sea, and the same would be for a lake. Uh, a pond. Yeah, yeah. So again, know your environment, know where you can go yeah. to, know where your escape routes are. Um, Jim, I hope you'll forgive me. I did say before the break that if people watching at home wanted to put any points to you, they can. And you know, sometimes it's okay, opinion of course. Uh, when we have you in. Uh, Christopher Renshaw says you're alarmist. Um, and uh, another question here says you are the merchant of doom. And um, people don't necessarily want to hear what you have to say. Okay. <laughs> so I just said 364 days a year, you, you'd be sitting pretty and there'd be no no problem. It isn't for all those days in this country, because there's other countries that it isn't 364 days. If you go to Zimbabwe, for example, now they're in massive drought. And I'm not an alarmist. Um, I, I speak the truth. I speak the science. OK, make, make that absolutely clear. So I, I do follow uh, NASA, NOAA, the Met Office, Hadley Centre uh, and, and, uh, and, and others in, in terms of what they're saying. I'm led by data. Uh, I'm not led by social media in that respect and 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 these people who follow those threads which are wrong which are wrong the evidence is very very clear um and the incidents of of uh, extreme weather are getting higher if 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 only and it's not if only but if only the fact that the human population is getting higher in an in places that they weren't there previously mm. uh, you know and, and in which case then you do put yourself at arm's length uh, just by the fact that we're a growing population so there's no alarms in them in this 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 is a case it's just like anything in the world you know medical wise for example if a doctor comes on and talks about uh, a certain way that you can avoid a certain you know, that's not alarmism, that's good advice. And I hope I'm giving that across to, to the people. And, you know, that's that's what it's about. Mm. You were enjoying the way he's titled his chapters, Eamon. Yeah, um, here's a song. They're, they're named after songs. You're yeah. to sing them for us. <laughs> Riders on the storm. Yeah. Uh, hurricanes and typhoons there. Twist and shout. But your, your first thing is, here comes the sun. Your, your, your preface uh, with all of this, which um, is a beautiful song which used to be associated with a BBC holiday programme um, as well. So it means good things to people, but increasingly yeah. not. Um, well, look, there's always something good. You, I, I, I 
I like to be a positive person. Yeah. And a bit like when I walked in the studio, I walked in, into here and I said, well, it's a nice day out there. And you said, you did not even seen it because it was dark when I got up. Yeah, I think for the most part, we can be positive with the weather. It's just that the climate is racing ahead of us. And that's, that's the danger now, that, it's, that, it, that it is racing ahead of us. Temperatures are, are ramping, and therefore, with much more energy into the atmosphere, we're going to see more of these ty types okay. of extreme events. Okay. Well, Jim, thanks very much indeed. Good luck with the book. Thanks. The book is Surviving Extreme Weather, uh, the Complete Climate Change Preparedness Manual. And there it is. And here is the weather. Bye-bye. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, a very good morning to you. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office. It's a bright start for many of us, but it will turn increasingly cloudy this morning with more rain to come, especially across western and northwestern parts. That's where the rain is already arriving through the morning. We keep the sunshine in the east at least until lunchtime, but, well, it does get squeezed out by thickening cloud and a freshening breeze along with those outbreaks of rain. The rain will be on and off and mostly light in the south Towards the northwest, it'll be heavy and persistent, particularly for Western Scotland, where there is a rain warning because of the saturated ground we currently have here. Temperatures up to 15 Celsius, not feeling very pleasant, though, with the cloud and those outbreaks of rain. However, once the rain does move through, it does turn drier for a time in the south and southeast, albeit with a lot of low clouds and hill fog. And then we've got further outbreaks of rain across many parts of the country, again, most persistent towards the west of Scotland overnight but a mild night because of the southwesterly wind and the extensive cloud cover, some places no lower than 12 or 13 Celsius. Now, Thursday morning starts off with those grey leaden skies staying damp and gloomy in the south, as well as the far northeast. In between, the cloud does break up for a time, so some sunshine coming through for Scotland, for northeast England, for example, and feeling considerably warmer. Temperatures up to 18 or 19 Celsius in the east before further rain comes along later. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding on the M6 in Warwickshire. The inside lane's closed southbound. There's an accident just before Junction 3, the Coventry and Uneaton turn. It's slow towards and past there. In the West Midlands, the A38's closed westbound along Bristol Road at Edgbaston in Birmingham after an accident causing delays towards Selly Oak. 